Hang on for a second here. With, with, with all the news going down and all the conversation going down, anything could break at any moment right now. Anything. But we always started out with big sales. You know, it's been an interesting time since Monday. Doesn't Monday seem like it was like four months ago now for the Eagle fans and the Eagle organization? It just seems like it's been four months. And there's no doubt about it that you have to think about the landscape of the NFL, the coaching searches, what's going on. I'm going to make a point to you right now about the Philadelphia Eagles and where they are when it comes to their decision, when it comes to Nick Sirianni and whether or not he's going to remain as the head football coach. I want you to put this in proper perspective here. If the Eagles didn't like the position that they were in right now, they would shut this conversation down immediately. That's an organization that likes to get in front of things. So to me, it's what the Eagles aren't saying that you need to be reading, not what they're saying. Because right now, that whole Sean Desai thing, you know, it makes more sense now. And me and Tone were talking about this a couple months ago. Remember when I said, all of a sudden they're doing up-down drills? Jalen Hurts is doing fumble drills? And Tone's like, Sills, they've been doing that. Yeah, but not put out there like that on websites and Twitter pages and all. It was like they wanted to get ahead of it. Then they made the decision to demote Sean Desai. That's an organization that wants to get ahead of things. They don't like anything lingering. So that's why where they are right now, allowing the conversation, nothing's been settled on Sirianni's future as head coach of the Eagles. I don't think at all. They're taking basically a historical game plan and page out of how they dealt with Doug. They're looking for coordinators. They want to know if he's going to go along with everything that they're saying and doing right now. And if there is a speed bump somewhere in this process, that could be detrimental to the future of Nick Sirianni. I think right now, Nick Sirianni is sitting on the hottest seat of any coach in the NFL. Because nothing's been determined. If that organization, Think about this. If that organization, knowing the way they operate with their PR department, wanted to shut that down, the owner and general manager would come out and say, I don't know what you guys are talking about. Nick Sirianni's our guy and always been our guy. That's not the case. It's what they're not saying. They're letting you know right now his job status is still being evaluated and that they're going to take a week to go through this process. Now, when, even though they're looking at new coordinators, that has nothing to do with the job status of Nick Sirianni. And everyone can put a conjecture on it. Hey, it looks like he's coming back. Wouldn't the Eagles just come out and say he's coming back? Jerry Jones did that today. Mike McCarthy, or late last night, Mike McCarthy's coming back. And by the way, don't think that Mike McCarthy's probably not going to not get an extension. You know what Jerry Jones did? He went with the 36 and 5. He's 81 years old. He went with stability. He doesn't want chaos, rip it apart, get a new guy, start over. He doesn't want it. He thinks they're close. They, I don't blame him for bringing Mike McCarthy back. You're 36 and 15 in three years. You really want to blow that up? For what? To bring something else in? 81 years old? Maybe take a step backwards? Very rarely do you see a new coach come in and all of a sudden he's going to take your team to a Super Bowl and actually win it. It doesn't happen like that. You got a decision to be made on Dak Prescott? Both Prescott, hey, get this. How do you know Jerry Jones isn't doing this? Tone, I don't know if you subscribe to this. Well, you know what I'm thinking I'm going to do? 
let's bring Mike back one year and Dak back one year. And if this thing goes to total, holy hell, I'll just hire Deion Sanders and bring his kid in, Shador Sanders. They got one more year at Colorado. How do you know he doesn't do that? And hire Deion like they did D'Amico Ryans in Houston. And then you bring in Shador Sanders too. Lori and Nick didn't even meet yesterday. Yeah, people got ahead of that report like they did the Jason Kelsey one. They would rather go yacht shopping than speak to Nick right now as reported. By the way, once again, if the Philadelphia Eagles wanted to squash that, that Nick wasn't the head coach, they would have already. Think about what the Cowboys are looking at. Well, we're going to run this back one more time. Both guys are coming back with one year left on their deals. Dak Prescott and Mike McCarthy. Doesn't work out. Deion Sanders and his kid comes to Dallas. Would that be out of the realm of possibility? No. Then he could pass the team off to Steven. Jerry Jones has two, three years left running the Cowboys. He's not going to blow that up. He took stability. The Steelers stuck with stability. Mike Tomlin. By the way, you know what's crazy? Mike Tomlin, since he won the Super Bowl, has an under 500 record. And I think Mike Tomlin, and I, I think the world of Mike Tomlin. But everybody's shitting all over Bill Belichick and what he did without Brady. Well, Mike Tomlin, since he won the Super Bowl, is under 500 in the postseason. Hard to win in that league. Would you be okay with Nick Frank and Patina? I, I, I have coordinators. We're going to look at offensive coordinators and the top defensive coordinators for potential hires for the Eagles. Because personally, until they decide what the head co- – you know, you know what's crazy? It really doesn't matter who the head coach is. They're looking for coordinators right now and quality coordinators to coordinate for the upcoming 2024 season. You know, I keep hearing people say – that Jalen Hurts is going to be part of the decision-making when it comes to who's going to be hired. I don't know if I necessarily believe that. I, I, I don't necessarily believe that. So you think that the quarterback has more, more say in Philadelphia than the head coach? Maybe. It could be. It, it could be. Carson Wentz had no say in anything. And they gave him the money first before they gave Jalen Hurts. He had no say in who his coordinators were. He had no say in the direction of the team or the personnel. Why would Wentz get it? Or why would Hurts get it? It's not something that they – did they ever give Donovan McNabb say in the direction of the team? I don't think so. So I don't know. I mean, has that been something in the past that they've given the quarterback at the Philadelphia Eagles any kind of autonomy or say? I don't think so. T.O. imploded on himself. I don't think Owens had anything, and McNabb had anything to do with that. That was something the front office did. Okay? He's 100% going to be a part of it. Why would he be a part of it? So let me ask you this. If he's going to be a part of it, why wouldn't he defend Brian Johnson? That's his boy. Is he coming back? Maybe that's what we'll know. If Brian Johnson comes back, Jalen Hurts probably had something to do with that. Then we'll know. He had something to do with the guy coming back. But if he doesn't come back, Jalen fired his friend? Doesn't support his head coach? Or is the decisions being made? Again, you know, it's great to say that. But that's just something that's been a precedent. In Philadelphia, will they change? Why would Jeffrey Lurie and Howie Roseman change a precedent when they don't believe they've done anything wrong yet? Remember something, that that tandem in the last two years has won 25 games in an NFC championship. And for all intent and purposes, they had a shitty year and they won 11 games. That's something to hang your hat on. you got to look at this at both sides, not just from one angle here. By the way, 
Do I want the guy fired? Yes. Do I think there's shitty coordinators in the room? Yes. But that's not how they operate. You can't think like you think. If that makes sense. You can't sit here and go like this. Well, this is what I would do. Well, that's not how that's not how they operate. There's a power structure in place for a reason there. The owner is involved in the decision making of the coordinators. Why? What would Jeffrey Lurie sitting on a yacht need to be informed on who his coordinators are? What is that? It's buffoonery. A guy sitting in the Caribbean wants to be informed who the coordinators are going to be in the job search and in the interviews. For what reason? I mean, who, who, I mean, what do you think? You're Ozzie Newsome? Hertz is Lori's golden child. He'll never have, he never had. <laughs> you got it wrong, man. These owners don't give a shit about people like that. These guys are widgets. You, you, you are under the impression that these owners love their players. That ain't all, that ain't the case. They'll fire these guys in 10 seconds. He gave Carson Wentz $38 million and one of the top contracts in the NFL at one time. Was he his golden boy too? Had to have been. You don't give a guy that kind of money and I think that that's his boy. You don't pay shitty people that kind of money. They picked wrong. Okay. Okay. Hey. Name me one quarterback that had say in anything in this Eagle organization under Jeffrey Lurie. But you think Jalen Hurts is going to have a say? He may. That'll be a course change. They be a course change. We need football guys. Well, you don't have football guys making football decisions. Look at your draft. Where in the building do you have football people making football decisions? Let me think. Stoutland? Who else? Here's the people making your football decisions. Two bookworms, the owner and the GM, and a yes man. Those are your three people making football decisions. Okay? Going to have to die in the vine with that. Again, I don't think anything is solidified that he's back yet. No way. I think if there's a trip or a skip over the speed bump, I think Sirianni's gone. But I think Nick's smart. He's going to maneuver through it because he doesn't have the equity that Doug had with the Super Bowl. By the way, are you really going to let Nick Sirianni go into this upcoming season, a lame duck coach? Is that how you're going to do it? <laughs> Think about that. Why don't you resolve this quickly? Either he is or he isn't. Give the guy an extension. Maybe not give him an, I don't know. Are you really going to let him walk? If Nick Sirianni is brought back, he will be already the number one head coach on the hot seat going into 24. Before the season even starts. If you bring him back, think about that. He'll, he'll be set up for disaster. If you don't win right away, there won't be a coach in the NFL that'll have a hotter seat than Sirianni. If you bring him back and you don't do something with quality assistant coaches around him. Listen, man, I'll tell you this, the problem that you have here is Roseman. He's the problem. He's got too much power in the building. He he has too much power over football operations. I mean, this guy is a capologist, plain and simple. That's it. Do I think he's a good organizer? I kind of do. I think there's a lot of quality to what this guy does, and there's some good assets that he brings to the organization. Would I give him a contract extension 
because of the way that he negotiated Hertz's contract? I've said it before. I would. He's brilliant. When it comes to drafting, he needs to take a seat. How short a leash do you think he'll be on next year? I told you already. I think Howie Roseman and everybody are looking at this thing, and I would say this to you. I would say that without a doubt, Nick Sirianni has eight games next year. He has eight games. Eight games. Now, let me ask you something before we move on to the topics here. Because you guys have pulled the Doug Peterson playbook right out here for Nick. Does he deserve to fix this? Eagles front office seems as bad as Jerry World. Carmina, yeah. Ask yourself this, and I think this is a fair question. Do you think Nick Sirianni, with the success that he has had, deserves the chance to turn this around? Yes or no? Three straight playoffs? Best winning percentage in the history of the Eagle organization as a head coach. Jalen Hurts was a runner-up MVP in his time. He's had two coordinators hired as head football coaches. He's had the number two defense in the NFL. He's had the number, like, what was it, nine passing game? Look, look, look at Maurice. Yeah, I get it. Doesn't he have the chance to turn this? You wouldn't give him a chance to turn this around. That I'm debating on this. Nick will be Brandon Staley. I see that. Peter, I don't, I don't, I don't know what's wrong or right here with this question. And I hate this question because I don't have conviction and I don't like that. Don't you think he has the right to turn this thing around? So, he takes you to a Super Bowl. You lose by three points. It's one of the worst endings in the history of the Eagle franchise and organization in history. And he doesn't, ha- he doesn't have the chance to turn it around. You don't want him to... I, I, I'm with you. I don't know that answer yet either. Because, again, at the end of the day, is he taking marching orders? If Nick Sirianni took that job with the premise of following marching orders instead of being a coach, that's the dynamic of the head coaching position of the uh, of the Eagles. I think it's best not to pay the quarterback big money, and in this league, put a ton of talent around him. You, You know, the key is guys on rookie contracts and quarterbacks on rookie contracts coming into the league, like. Look at what CJ, here, the the Texans are going to be a superstar organization if they can keep Nick Nick Casario in the building. They're going to be a superstar franchise. Why do you think the Texans are going to be one of the best teams in the league in the next three years? Do you guys, surely you understand this. They just edited Kelsey and Fletcher's endorsing Nick on X. They had a chance to post what they were saying about it. You're right, Sills. Joseph. The Eagles are not going to endorse Nick Sirianni. Think about that. So they they edited the endorsement of Nick out. We need to keep Nick, get great OC and DC, and things will turn around. Maybe. Because it did a year ago, right? You have precedent on that. Think about what the Philadelphia Eagle PR department just did to you guys. If that's the case, they edited and I'm taking your word on it, and they edited it and posted it on their social media pages, that's all you need to know. There's no endorsement for Nick Sirianni yet by the Eagles. They are not publicly endorsing him. Think about that. Kind of goes along with the quarterback. Is the quarterback following marching orders too? Has Jeffrey Lurie told him and Howie told him, don't endorse Nick yet? Is Jalen part of it? Because maybe you guys are right. Jalen is part of the decision-making process. 
The only person that's not, as a player, endorsing Nick that needs to is Jalen. And the only people in management that haven't endorsed Nick is the owner and GM. Kind of goes hand in hand, don't you think? Think about that. <laughs> think about that. Does he get the chance to turn this around? Let me ask you something. As close as you were to the Super Bowl in 22, and as far as, as, far as you were away at the end of the season in 23, does it really make sense to bring in a brand new head football coach at this time right now? Do you think the ship can be righted? Because I'm going to make a point to you here. If the ship can't be righted, Jalen Hurts can't be righted. Jalen Hurts is not going to be a better quarterback with a better head coach when the job description has nothing to do with the development of the player. We all know now Shane Steichen was the guy who was developing him. Nick Serena has nothing to do with the development of Jalen Hurts as a quarterback. The head coach won't matter. That's why, get this, the number one priority in Philadelphia right now, it's not whether Nick's the head coach. It's who's going to be around Jalen. He gets one season to turn this around, but that's it. Dirty D, I'm, I don't know if that's the right call. Jalen's not that good. We were saying the same shit about Lamar Jackson last year. I'd be careful with that. I think in the NFL, coaching matters. That's Josh Allen. I was listening to Tone and uh, Rob talking about, would you take Jalen Hurts over this quarterback, over that quarterback, over this quarterback? I would take pretty much any quarterback right now over Jalen Hurts until they figure out if they're going to get quality people in here around him. I don't think Jalen Hurts, right now, Jalen Hurts' chances of becoming a star quarterback again in this league are slim. And here's why. Are, who are you putting around him? Who are you helping him with? Get this. It doesn't matter if you have A.J. Brown or Devontae Smith or 2,000-yard receivers or whether or not you have the best O-line. You look like shit at the end of the year. You had the same personnel. This isn't a talent issue on offense. This is a directional issue. This is a developmental issue. Do you understand something here, the difference between people? You know, it's funny when you listen to people talking about the Eagles. There's two sides of the ball. One's been neglected. The other side of the ball has been neglected, but in a different manner. The defensive side is a personnel delect. Uh, it, it's, it's a personnel issue. Schematics. But get this. Last year, the scheme wasn't the issue. The scheme wasn't the issue last year, was it? 70 sacks, you got home. Ton of pressure. Volume of pressure was up. You 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 had red red linebackers like you did a year ago. You had mercenary corners. What's different? The players. That's a talent on that side of the ball. That's a talent neglect. What's the excuse on offense? You don't have an excuse. It's a developmental issue. You have two thousand yard receivers. Get this. Every single person. On the Philadelphia Eagle offense, had a career year offensively as a skilled guy. Who's the best OC Eagles? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I have the list of this. What's your excuse? Every guy had a career year. What's your excuse for losing six to seven on the offensive side? What's your excuse? Every guy had a career year. Throw for more yards, more receiving yards. Run it back, had a career year. Gave you 1,500 yards or 1,400 yards of total offense. What's your excuse? Well, hold on. Kaboom. Brings a great point up. Dan, take a stand. I told you I want him out. I'm telling you again, once again, Kaboom doesn't hear what I said. 
So let me reiterate it. I know what I would do. You got to think like they're going to do. What do you mean? What haven't you heard me say when I said fire that clown? What haven't you heard? I asked you the question because that's what they're asking themselves. Dude, you can't think like a normal human being would think whether or not this guy is a football coach or not because he's not. But that's not the job description. You're not a football coach in Philadelphia. You're a manager. You're like a department head. You're not a football coach. You don't develop. He had nothing to do with the development of Jalen Hurts. The assistant coaches did. Nothing. Shane Steichen proved it to you. What are you talking about, stand? I'm not kissing anybody. My God Almighty, once again. Dude, you're not thinking like they are. You're not thinking like they are. And this is your problem. And this is why you think everything is going to be normal. And they're going to come up with Bill Belichick or some other big. That's not what they do. Holy shit, the people that have fed you bullshit for all these years and covering that team have fed you nothing but nonsense. That's not how that organization rolls and how they move. It starts with number one thing, control. If you start with control, and you know what the second most important thing is? What do you think the second most important thing is in that building? What do you think in the Philadelphia Eagle management, what do you think is the second most important thing? One is control. What's the second thing? It's money. And how it's dispersed. Then, it's talent. Then, it's the pawn coaches. Dude, control and money. That's what wrecked your season. Well, the bad coach. Okay. Control and money is what ruined your season. Lack of money on defense. The lack of control on offense. You couldn't control the fact that you hired a bad coordinator for Jalen. It went downhill the whole way. And you know what Brian Johnson is? He's a guy that puts up good numbers. A score but really doesn't win games. He's one of those coordinators. Numbers? Because people go, you know, the numbers look, yeah. Well, then how'd you lose six to seven? And critical ball games. Do you know how many chances you, how many mulligans did the Eagles get last year to win the East? Three? You got, the Cowboys gave you three mulligans. Three mulligans, and you still put them in a hook, and you still hooked it into the trees. Three mulligans. The defense, hey, you have two separate football teams in one group. The defensive side of the ball was so neglected with a coordinator with players, with money, with direction. You know, I'm stunned how that thing fell on its face. And get this, the inconsistency in the offense, it exasperated the defense's doom. That looked like Chip Kelly teams. I'm going to look at these coordinators here, and I'll tell you where you're going to pick them from. Now, I'm also going to say this. James, this is true. Frank Wright has been contacted by the Philadelphia Eagles, not only as a potential offensive coordinator, 
but he's working also with helping Nick and the front office go through some of these coordinators. He is involved. And to what extent will his job be moving forward? That I don't know. But he is consulting Nick Sirianni in the search for coordinators. Just so you know. Will he take the OC job? I can't answer that because I don't know really. Frank won't answer that. Frank is giving the owner, the general manager, and Sirianni input on coordinators around the NFL. And I've got a list of those names on both sides of the football. These are the names that I got from people close to the situation. Can I tell you how I know this? After I text Frank during the show, um, I text him back and he goes, I think my silence tells you all you need to know. My question was, are you involved in the process? And have they reached out to you? My silence is all you need to know. I've no demand for 45 years. Sirianni's to Jalen is what Urban Meyer was to um, Lawrence. That's not true. They went to a Super Bowl together last year. That That's extreme stuff, Dirty D. They were in a Super Bowl last year. Urban Meyer, the only way he's getting to a Super Bowl is if he buys a ticket. Mass goes that Frank got fired and he's used goods. Nobody's asking him to be the head coach, Mask. Once again, we're defining roles here. And, and for the record, Mask, he recommended Shane Steichen as the offensive coordinator for uh, Nick Sirianni. He also was the guy that recommended Jonathan Gannon. And both those guys are head football coaches now. And both those, both those coordinators got you to a Super Bowl. So whatever you want to say about Gannon, and Steichen, those are recommendations by Frank to Nick. I think they keep cheerleader Nick Pinocchio and higher quality people around Jalen. Okay? That's right, LJ. That's a great point on what LJ, that's the best point LJ's made in quite some time there. Frank brought the best out of Wentz in Philly and in Indy. And he would do the same with Hertz. I, I believe that. I believe that. Because Frank works, <clears throat> Frank works from limitations. Okay? Frank works from limitations. So, I got to keep an eye on my phone here because... You could get a conversation. I don't I, I don't know if Frank's going to take that job. I don't know if he wants that commitment. I'm talking OC. But I've got names, and I'm going to give them to you here in a minute. So they're using Frank's lead relationships to keep Sirianni his job? No. Remember. Sirianni is in a process right now. It's called the Doug Peterson process. If they're comfortable with the hirings and they're comfortable with the suggestions and they're comfortable with the people. And by the way, I think it's a stroke of genius by Sirianni reaching out to Frank because Frank is revered in the front office. That's going to keep his job because he's reaching out to people they trust. Don't you get this? This is a game. This is a game. You're going to reach out to Frank. You're going to get Doug Peterson's input. You're going to get Mike McCoy's input. 
you're going to ask those guys for their input because why? The owner of the Eagles and the GM, they respect those guys' opinions. That's how you keep your job and take away some of those speed bumps in this Doug Peterson process. You know, we got Doug Peterson fired was the process. They gave him eight days to hang himself, and he did. Doug probably had a different opinion on what he wanted on coordinators and assistant coaches, and that was against the grain of what they wanted, and that's what got him fired. If Frank takes OC job, does Carolina still pay? That I that I don't. I think they here, and I'm just going to use a number of ten million. If they owe him ten million a year for the next three years, say, and the Eagles hire him for four million, three million, okay, I think Carolina's off the hook for three, and they only have to pay him seven. I think that's how that works, or. That three goes to Carolina. Something like, I think they're they're built into the contracts like that now. It's a good question. I don't know. I'll do some research on that. Okay? The best quarterbacks have a great offensive mind. That's correct. Okay? Coaching them for extended periods of time. Last time we had consistency was Reed and McNabb. It's a great call. It's it's absolutely true. Absolutely true. Every single one of these guys, and you you can even go in NFL history. Uh, Joe Montana, Bill Walsh. Okay, look, go through the history of the greatest, North Turner and Aikman. Not that Turner was a great head coach. He was a great OC. Worked from the Zampezi line. Absolutely, all the great guys who won multiple Super Bowls, Mike Shanahan, John Elway, all these guys had people in the building that knew how to move the chains, develop quarterbacks, and develop schemes. Jalen had it. Jalen probably, I would make this point to you. Jalen Hurts was probably coached to the best of his ability last year because he had the best offensive coach he's ever had around him. And that's the kind of thing you need for Hertz is to get that dynamic. Because you know why? If you don't have that dynamic, you'll never know if Hertz was ever going to live up to what they thought and paid him for. You know, Tone brings it up all the time. They're paying him for what they see his growth spurt was and what potentially could be. Theoretically, Jalen Hertz was paid on potential. He'll never reach that potential unless you get him the best coaches possible around him just to see if he can. And if he doesn't, he doesn't. And if he does, you got what you got a year ago. But why would you fall short of that? By hiring something less than that. That does not make sense. It never did from day one. When I told you, and we were talking in the offseason, you don't think these two new coordinators are going to have an impact on this team this year? Eh, no, don't worry about it. Everything will be great. Everybody's that did it. And I'm like, I don't know. Plus the turnover you had? They got out to a great start, and it kind of was like, damn. And get this, everybody, including my network and everyone, how are you killing a team that's 8-0? It just doesn't look right. You know, it never looked right from day one to me. Even in the New England game. When I first noticed this, damn, Hurts is sliding before contact. Hadn't seen that before. Is that just me? That probably sells just, you know, something to keep an eye on. I think it's something to keep an eye on. Well, it played itself out all year, business decisions. That was just a microcosm of what was to play out. And we saw it play out completely in the Tampa game. Okay. You see, what we did was we put too much faith in how we retooling the team. I did too. We put too much faith in, you know what we did? We overrated Howie Roseman. Howie Roseman, we overrated him. The media did. I did. 
We overrated him for the job he did last year. Think about this, for instance. I've said this to you. You're never, ever as great as the season you ever had, and you're never as bad as the season you've had in your career. You're somewhere in the middle. Boy, these last two years can't be any more of a statement for Howie Roseman than that. He ain't as good as he was last year, and he ain't as bad as he is this year. He's somewhere in the middle. I think that's a fair comment and commentary on Roseman. There's things he does well. There's things he does horribly. You know know what I think his biggest problem is? He gets in his own way. He gets in his own way. And that becomes a problem. All right. These are the names I got. You guys want to go offensive coordinator or do you want to go defensive coordinator first? Dan, would Frank teach Nick to be a better offensive play caller? That's not what the head coach's job is in Philly. The head coach's job in Philly is to kind of be a department head. Honest to God, he's not a coach. He doesn't develop. He doesn't do anything when it comes to making you better. Case in point, case studies hurts. Did he do anything this year to develop Jalen Hurts into being a better player? Absolutely nothing. Did Jalen Hurts do one thing better this year than he did a year ago? No. Nothing. He did nothing better. There was nothing I saw Jalen Hurts do this year. Okay? Hey, the Buffalo game, the fourth, the fifth quarter, I loved it. And that's my hope, is the fifth quarter. But I see the fifth quarter against Buffalo, and I saw the four quarters against Tampa in the playoff game. Man, you can't be that different of a dude. Got to be, you know, you know what I mean? Last impression, sock kid. And that Tampa, whatever behavior and bedside manner you had was brutal. Now, by the way, too, Jalen not defending Nick. I'll say this to you. I don't think that's his nature. I just don't. You know? You know, the, the, you would hope that your highest paid player is your leader of your team. That doesn't always necessarily pan out like that. You know, Jalen Hurts, for all the things that he says or doesn't say, one of the things, too, also, I think he struggles at two things, talking about himself and endorsing other people and throwing praise. I do. I don't really think he's, you know, he's still learning to be in front of the mic, too. He's a young kid. I think you got to give him time there. Okay. You know, before I move on, so Darius Slay comes out. What was what was the quote? Eagles defensive coordinator change was like being in two marriages. That's chaos. Lack of communication, lack of focus. Lack of direction, lack of understanding, lack of passion, everything. You're, 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 you know what he's saying to you here? You're, you're a master to two servants. You're, you're like a peasant to two servants. You know, you, you know, one's telling you one thing, the other's telling you another thing. One person's telling you this scheme. One person is telling you that scheme. And it's so look like that. Hey, don't hate on Slay for pointing something out that was obvious and true. Slay's not wrong here. It's exactly when you run, when you watch people running into people and not knowing proper technique and can't communicate with one another, that's exactly what he's talking about. Guys running into one another. I mean, you're you're basically like I said, one person's telling you this, one person's telling you that, one person's saying this, one person's saying that. 
This is all in a game plan week. It's confusing and aggravating and frustrating. He's saying he's got two headaches. Sure. It is a headache. What's the most important thing that you can have also as a coach? Clarity. There was no clarity in the building. They have no clarity in the building at all. One voice. Well, your head coach doesn't have a voice. Who said Nick Sirianni had a voice ever? Oh, some of you thought he did. Must be very disappointing for some of you to find out that Nick wasn't really who you thought he was. Why would any good or experienced coordinator want to work in that structure? Unless it's friendship with head coach or excitement excitement to be a first coordinator like we've been dealing with. You guys are missing pro football, Big Marshall. I'll say it again to you. $5 million will do it. Opportunity to be elevated from being a passing coordinator to a coordinator. You know, let's not, let's not get it twisted here. Last year, you had two guys who went on to become a head football coach in the league. This year, you had two guys struggle. Okay. So you're batting 500. If I'm a, if I'm a guy and I'm a position coach and I get the call to be a coordinator, you're damn right. I'm taking that job. Wait a minute to be that defense or offensive coordinator, the Philadelphia Eagles. You're telling me I wouldn't want to want to have that job. Well, what are the parameters? Well, we'll work through it. I'm not turning that job down. I'm not turning that job down. Dude, you, you're in the league as a coach to elevate also. Well, no, I won't take that job. And by the way, that starts getting around that you won't take jobs because of whatever. You know what that does? Those 3,200 guys start teaming up going, that guy's an asshole. Why don't you ask Brian Flores about that? You know, Brian Flores has no job interviews. He has no job interviews. And he set that thing up down in Miami for the current head coach. He has no job interviews. <laughs> Be careful when you start passing jobs up. Got to know how the league works, friends. What do you guys want first? The offense? I got this list. And... I've got these names that the Eagles are looking at. What side of the ball do you want to hear first? They're in the process of trying to get interviews with all these guys. One of them, I'm not so sure. Let's do defense. Here are the six names that are being considered for defensive coordinator for the Philadelphia Eagles or trying to get interviews for them to be coordinators in Philly for 2024. Leslie Frazier, ex-Bills defensive coordinator, last three seasons, him being the coordinator up in Buffalo. They had a top five unit. They were one of the better units in the National Football League. Leslie's one of the great, brilliant minds. He's off the Tony Dungy tree. Um, he's off the Mike Tomlin tree as well. They all work together in Tampa. Um, and they understand cover two. They understand schemes. They go 34-43. They're very good at it. Leslie Frazier took some personal time off for family. And I think he is one of the great minds that's in the National Football League. And to me, it would be an absolute upgrade getting somebody like Leslie Frazier in your building as your defensive coordinator. Number two, Jesse Minter, Michigan defensive coordinator. Worked in Baltimore with John Harbaugh and obviously worked with Jim Harbaugh uh, this past season, won a national championship. Heck of a recruiter. The one advantage that you have over the other current coaches that are in the NFL is what? 
recruiting, which means you know a lot of the kids that are coming out into the draft, which means it doesn't necessarily mean you have to have a first-round pick. Jesse's going to understand, by the way, and he's 40 years old, kind of fits the profile. Jesse Minner is somebody that the Eagles really respect, really like, and here's a guy here that's going to be coveted by a lot of NFL teams, not just wherever Jim Harbaugh goes, because, again, that's probably you're looking at a guy who would potentially become the next head football coach in Michigan if Jim takes that job in Los Angeles with the Chargers. So you're going to have to kind of wait there a little bit on that. And Jesse Mentor, a 40-year-old kid, worked both with the Harbaugh's and has been recruiting and knows a lot of the college personnel coming into the draft. It would know that for the next three years. So he'll be able to look at players and help the personnel department. And it's always great to get somebody like that that understands um, the personnel that's coming out of college right now. Because you can find guys. That was one of the things that helped Pete Carroll and Jimmy Johnson. What was it? Well, those two guys were recruiting national championship powerhouse teams. And that's why they were able to get guys in the second and third and fourth and fifth rounds. And they were able to talent evaluate. That entire legion of boom was not really built with first rounders. It was built with later round guys. That's because Carroll knew where the talent was hidden. Can you imagine having Leslie Frazier and Frank Reich as your coordinators? Change your whole world. And I like Jesse Minter. Glenn Schumann, Georgia, defensive coordinator, two-time national champion, heck of a recruiter, has been coveted by a lot of NFL teams over the last three years to become a D.C. Um, he's currently making about $3.5 million as a coordinator down there. He was almost a coordinator in Philadelphia last year. They interviewed him, by the way, a year ago, and he is highly respected in that building in Philadelphia. Um, I, think he, I think they offered it to him. And he turned it down because he wanted to stay at Georgia, try to win that third straight national title. I don't know where his head would be right now. Georgia's probably got the best recruiting class in the country. He had a lot to do with that. He's a heck of a recruiter. He's got a great scheme. They do some really great things. Obviously, the Eagles have a high regard for the Georgia Bulldog player. Um, he turned it down a year ago. Now, again, knock on the door again. See what happens here. This is somebody that they are – hoping to get another interview with so that they can get him into the building, potentially become a coordinator in Philly. Don Martindale, Wink Martindale, ex-giant defensive coordinator. My only problem with him is he loves the 34. And that's something that I don't think is conducive when you have people like Jalen Carter. I mean, the 34 is, to me, it's outdated a little bit. But what Wink does is he's really great at disguising when it comes to blitzes. But here's the problem you have with Wink. Wink's going to want to bring his own people in. Would the Eagles be open to that? Having him bring in his own linebacker coach, his own corner coach, his own this and that. Um, I just, I just don't know if the Eagles, again, a conversation with him. Remember something, too, when you get a conversation with Martindale. When you're talking to a guy like that, I think he's 60. When you're talking to a guy like that, you can also, also, also ask him his opinion on other people that are out there. So you're kind of interviewing him for other kind of candidates as well. So he'd be an asset here also. Do I think he's a probability? I think you interview him because he's like a Fangio. You're looking for experience right now. You're looking for people to mend the fences on that defensive side of the ball. Eric Washington, Bill's assistant coach, D-line coach. He's the assistant head football coach because last year, obviously, the head coach took over duties as the play-calling defensive coordinator in Buffalo last year because Leslie Frazier resigned for personal reasons. You know, that's the only reason that the head coach in – Buffalo took over was because Leslie resigned. And so he took over and Eric has been a really good, they've done a nice job. They've had a lot of injuries on that football team. And Eric Washington's a very hot name. A lot of people want to see him 
as a potential candidate to be interviewed by the Philadelphia Eagles, and he's going to get a lot of run. You know, this is going to be interesting here. And I had a conversation with Frank on this. Would the Eagles ever do this? And he said, the Eagles are doing this. Denard Wilson, Baltimore Ravens, knows the culture, knows the building. I don't think it's un beneath the Eagles to go like this, okay? Look at what you did with Hamilton and the developing of the safety position. Look at what you did with the secondary in Baltimore. Okay, you proved your point. You're the new D coordinator of the Eagles. You know the culture. You know the building. You know the power structure. You know everything. You were right. Would they do that? They may. They like him. He was right. He proved the Eagles wrong. I, have, I, I would not look at that as a negative. If I'm Philly, I look at that as a positive. I would go, you're wrong. You're right. I was wrong. Here's the coordinating job. And that's the question. Would he come back? Why wouldn't he? Dude, don't get, butt ho don't get butt hurt over things. It's how you get elevated. It's how you get elevated. Okay? People make bad decisions. You can't, you can't die in the vine like that. You got to do what's in the best interest of your career and what's in the best interest of where you want to get to. Leslie Frazier, Jesse Minter, D.C., Michigan, Michigan Wolverines. Glenn Schumann, Georgia, D.C. Wink Martindale, ex-Giant, D.C. Eric Washington, Bill's assistant coach, D-line coach was really the pseudo-coordinator in Buffalo this year. And Denard Wilson, secondary coach, Ravens. Those are your six guys. Now, here are the offensive guys. You got to remember something here. This is about developing your quarterback and helping him get to where he was a year ago, you stunted his growth. I blame the organization for that. I don't blame Sirianni. Because you blame Sirianni this year, do you give him kudos for last year? Or was he just following orders again? Pay Denard Wilson whatever he wants. Get him in the building now. I I, I, he, I think he makes the most sense of anybody because he knows them. He knows the, and by the way, when he knows the personnel, plus there's going to be a revamping on that side of the ball on personnel. Plus maybe some of the suggestions that he had a year ago, the Eagles, the Eagles have to look at Denard Wilson's interview now in a different light. When he was interviewing for that job in the off season, they have to look at that differently. Have to look at that. They have to look at it. He was right. He was right about the secondary. He was right about the corners. You know what's crazy? This is just a high, you know what? This is just a guess. I wonder if he suggested that you need Gardner Johnson back and not Bradbury. And that's what got him out of the building. Or he didn't want one of them corners back, but he wanted Gardner Johnson. And that's what got him out of the building. Because something went sideways in the interview. I think it had to do with personnel. Because he was good in the scheme. Had a great secondary last year. It's not personal, it's just business. Absolutely the correct thing. NFL, man, don't take anything personal. Don't Hey, don't take anything personal. Don't burn bridges. Do not burn bridges. Here are the offensive coordinators. For the Eagles. Obviously, Frank Wright, 
two-time head coach, Eagle offensive coordinator that won the Super Bowl. As I said, I'm partial to this one here. Um, I got you, Dirty D. See it? Um, he he is a boutique guy. If I'm not mistaken, I think Frank's had 14 different position jobs, worked his way up the chain, worked for two of the worst owners on the planet, and Tepper and Ursay. Um, he's got a great demeanor. He knows the organization. He's got a ton of connect. By the way, if you hire Frank Reich, you know the assistant coaches you bring in because of the connections that he has with people all throughout the league? You got to remember something about assistant coaches. They're gypsies. You live a gypsy life when you're an assistant in the NFL. You're going from job to job, to city to city. Frank must, if you know, I, I don't know. Somebody could do it for me. Look on Wikipedia and count how many assistant jobs in the NFL Frank's had. I think it's something like between 12 and 14 that he's had. I'm talking about assistants. I'm not even talking about a head coaching job. All the numerous assistant jobs that he's had, he's worked his way up. And you know what that means? That means you've got connections into assistant coaches. And so you understand that you can make a call to a guy and go, hey, you want to come up here? You know, he can also raid guys like Doug Peterson's staff because guys on that Doug Peterson staff are also loyal to Frank. Is it 14? Eight different assistant roles for Reich. Think about that. Eight different assistant jobs that he's had. Not counting head coaching gigs. Look at the people he knows. Why wouldn't you, if you're the Eagles, contact Frank Reich and go, Frank, we're looking for assistance. Gotcha. And here we go. Now, again, these are not head coaching jobs. Cliff Kingsbury, USC quarterback coach. Head coach at Arizona, 19 to 22. Texas Tech, 2013 to 18. Developed. And coached and recruited Patrick Mahomes and had Kyler Murray with him. And those guys won some ball games. I think the last, I think the one year he was healthy, they won 11 ball games. Um, so Cliff Kingsbury, by the way, he's making a ton of money with the Arizona Cardinals, a ton of money. But he still shows you he wants to coach. Do I think he's a really good offensive-minded guy? I do. As a head coach, I don't know. Okay? I don't know. As a head coach, but as an offensive-minded guy, I think he's really talented. Okay? Number three, Zach Robinson, Rams passing game coordinator, quarterback coach, and obviously – this is something right here, and I would make a comparison, and you guys are probably going to die when I make this comparison. Zach Robinson's got a lot of characteristics of Andy Reid. Okay? And he is highly thought of around the NFL as an up-and-coming coordinator for a guy that can really move the sticks. He's a guy that's working with Sean McVay. Sean McVay, and he, Sean McVay, next to Andy Reid, could arguably be considered one of the greatest play-calling head coaches in the NFL. Look at his resume. As much as everyone loves Matt LaFleur, Matt LaFleur and all those guys, they were in Washington with Jay Gruden. They worked together. Sean McVay, too. They were all on that coaching staff in Washington. They know one another. All of them. Kyle, Matt, Sean, all in Washington. I mean, you, you're, you're around a guy like McVay. You know what that's like? Andy Reid being around Mike Holmgren. Okay? I don't have a problem with, 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 with a guy 37 years old. Why in the world would you have a problem with age? I want quality. That's like saying I'd have a problem with a 60-year-old coordinator. Dude, I don't give a shit about what your age is. I care if you're good. 
Are you a good DC or are you a good OC? What the hell does age have to do with anything? So you're telling me you wouldn't hire Sean McVay because he's 38 years old. Well, now I would, Sills. Oh, I knew he was a great hire. John Gruden recommended him. By the way, not for anything, that Carmichael guy being fired in uh, New Orleans, John Gruden's going to be become the offensive coordinator in New Orleans. And you want to hear something? John Gruden may become the head football coach in New Orleans next year. Gruden's going to be the OC of that team. That, that's almost a certainty that he's joining that coaching staff. They're working through some shit because of the lawsuit. There's a lot of things going on. And John wants to coach again. John Gruden's going to be the offensive coordinator in New Orleans with Derek Carr. That's happening. Okay? That's happening. That guy is still being paid a ton of money by the Raiders. And trust me when I tell you, John Gruden's situation is the only thing stopping him from people not making him one of the big candidates to be a head football coach in the league. Because if he didn't have all that shit with the email, he'd be a number three candidate to be a head coach in the league. And the Saints are looking at it like that. Okay, I know there's a lot of bullshit and baggage here, but he is some coach. And that's how the NFL looks at people. Deshaun Watson, all those rape cases. You know what? He's a hell of a player. That's how the league looks at people. Kind of shitty, isn't it? Sorry to have to pull the onion back on you. Man, there's a lot of rape cases and sexual accusations against 27 of them against Watson. They gave him a raise. They guaranteed his contract. He's the face of the Cleveland Browns. That didn't seem to stop him. You think that those stupid ass racist emails are going to stop the Saints from hiring him? No. Yeah, but still, that's not right. Who says being right has anything to do with anything the league does? Tired of hiring guys that's around the main guy that's a revolving a revolving door. Zach Robinson is one of the hottest names out there. Watson is not a good face for anyone. Well, that's all. That's an opinion. Facts are Cleveland made him a face of their franchise. That's great, Greasy. That's an opinion, right? Because the facts are he's got over a quarter of a billion dollars in his pocket, all guaranteed, as the face of the Browns and one of the faces of the NFL when it comes to the 32 quarterbacks in the league. Is that not the facts? Your, your, your comment's an opinion. Mine is a fact. He's one of the 32 men on the planet with $230 million in guaranteed money in his wallet. He's one of the faces of the NFL, the biggest television property of any television network. He's one of the biggest stars in the world. Well, he's not really a good face of anything. Well, the league didn't look at it that way because they gave him a raise and they guaranteed his money. Again, I know you guys don't want to hear this stuff. Yeah, that's not hot take shit. That's fact. I mean, you say whatever you want. Hey, John Gruden had racist emails. So what? League don't look at it. Hey, you and me think that's shitty. Absolutely. But at the end of the day, the league don't look at it that way. Saints are going to hire him as OC. And they're going to elevate him once Dennis Allen gets fired. And they're going to make him interim head coach. Then he's going to become the head coach. And John Gruden is going to be back coaching in the NFL again. And you know what they're going to do? They're going to get him at $5 million bucks or $6 million bucks instead of having to pay him $20 million. And that's how the Benson family is going to look at it. They got a deal for a guy who had some racist emails, who's a great coach. <laughs> I got a bargain deal for a great coach. John Gruden's a better coach than Mike Vrabel. But Mike Vrabel is going to make $15 million. You don't have to pay John Gruden 15. Don't you get it? Or do I really have to paint this out to you like that? <laughs> I think you know it. You just don't want to admit it. You think the Eagles can get? I like that kid, Leonard. DC from Wisconsin. I, I, I like him. Okay, I do. 
I, I, I like him. Okay. Steve goes, Gruden's a douche. Really? Congratulations for being what? Right? Since when does being a douche have anything to do with being hired in the NFL? That's right. Mickey Loomis loves John Gruden. Correct. That's why he had him in as a consultant. And some of you are going to go like this. Yeah, what about the racist emails? Irrelevant. Since when do they give a shit about the players and what they think? You guys think this is some sort of like democracy? <laughs> you think an NFL front office and locker room is a democracy? Like the world you live in, right and wrong? What world do you live in? Oh, that's right. The the pretend world of right and wrong. Yeah, that's right. Jaron, the NFL is the place where douches win. Right. That's that, probably the statement of the year. Probably the statement of the year. Chad O'Shea, Browns passing coordinator, worked with Tom Brady, worked with Shanahan, worked with St uh, Kevin Stefanski. This guy's worked with a ton of people, man. And he's really done a nice job in, in Cleveland working with Kevin Stefanski when they had to go through all those quarterbacks. He's another guy that would potentially be. Message to the fans, follow the money. Thank you, Q. That was Raider Gruden. Not Saints Gruden. Does it matter? Daryl Bevel, Dolphins passing coordinator, has worked with Favre, Russell Wilson, Matthew Stafford, Trevor Lawrence, Tua, and Mike McDaniel loves the guy. Um, here's your names. Frank Reich, Cliff Kingsbury, Zach Robinson, passing coordinator for the Rams, Eric Bieniemy. You have to put on that list as well. Would he be too? See, you got to remember something about Eric Bieniemy. Here, I'll, I'll ask you. I'll ask you something very simple here. Would the Eagles ever hire Seth Joyner as the coordinator of the Eagles? Would they? Okay. Would they ever? Would Would they ever hire Seth Joyner as? Defensive coordinator in Philadelphia. No. Well, then they're not going to hire Eric Bieniemy Because Eric Bieniemy has that same kind of mentality as well. Okay? Just so you know, he's a no-shit kind of guy, and he gets in your ass. So, all right. We're going to take a time out here, and we're going to talk more about, obviously, the direction of what they have to do this week. And I think the process – it's going to be very important for Nick to have to maneuver through when you're looking at all these assistants. I'm going to talk more about Frank Reich's involvement in your team's selection of finding coordinators for this team. I think that list will grow over the next couple of days here. So we'll continue to do that. Don't forget our great friends over at Hooters. Folks, again, you get an opportunity, log online to northeasthooters.com and you can get yourself some of the calendars that are out for 2024 there's $100 in gift certificates that are out there we got coupons inside of them don't forget this weekend with football with the divisional rounds two dollars off of each and every single pitcher that you get and a dollar will go to local charity so again great time for all don't forget the lunch specials monday to friday 11 30 to 3 p.m boneless <laughs> wings happy hour monday to friday four to six six items six bucks NortheastTutors.com. That's NortheastTutors.com. And do me a favor when you roll in, tell them Big Sill sent you. and Hooters, the perfect pair.
Any professional sports coach will tell you there's no substitution for preparation. At Malamut & Associates, that is a tenet by which we live. We prepare from day one for victory. Anything less is not acceptable. Underdog Fantasy has a way for you to play alongside your favorite football team all season long with their Fantasy Pick'em game. You pick between two to five players, select whether they'll go higher or lower on one of their stats, then do what you usually do on a Sunday, watch the games. You can win up to 20 times your money in a single game by going five for five. It's a fantasy game. And the sports betting show wants you to get involved. Go to underdogfantasy.com. When you sign up, use the promo code WIN, and Underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. G-L-E-S Eagles Frank Sills, National Football Show. I'm going to tell you more about Frank Reich's involvement. Also, I would make a prediction that there's probably going to be about one Two, out of your starting 22, you'll probably have ten new players in your starting 22 next year. It's going to be essential to have an experienced coaching staff in place to overcome that with new faces, new techniques, new direction. I would say this too, you know, I think that you have to remember something about the style of defense that the Eagles are playing. That's not something that's just centric to Philly. That style of play now, keep everything underneath and don't give up the big play. That's becoming a formula across the league, in my opinion. That's something that's going on across the league. So to me, that's something that you have to take into consideration how you're building your team. Now, if you're going to build your team like that and you're going to go with that philosophy, the only reason that you build your team like that is why? Because you're paying your quarterback. Let me show you something here. I like the Miami tight end. He had a ninth year. Jesus Christ, he's not a – excuse me. I apologize for that. Um you guys on a GI bill. The only reason that you're able to do that is because your quarterback is on a rookie deal and you're not paying him. Is the reason that you can build your football team like the Niners can. But once you start paying your quarterback, you have to be economically sound in your cap. And that's what Howie got ahead of himself on this year. You see, Howie prepared his salary cap for 2025 by going cheap on the defense in 2023. You know, he, he wants to stay ahead of the curve here. Remember what he said a couple of years ago, or maybe even this past offseason? What was one of the things that he said? If you're thinking about doing something right now and you're going and copying what someone else is doing now, you're late to the game. Man, this pisses me off. We aren't further in the playoffs. Khalid, get, get this. Hey. He, you know, I want to put this more into consideration also. What you guys were asking that Eagle, here, I'm not going to make an excuse in any way whatsoever for that shitty performance down the stretch two months. But what you were asking those guys to do was impossible. You wanted them to get back to a Super Bowl when very few teams in the history of the league have ever gotten back to a championship game and you thought your guys were special, they weren't special. I hate to break this to you. There's very few. 
there's very few teams that are special. Teams that are special win Super Bowls and multiple. You lost, but yet you thought your team was special. It's not special. You thought your quarterback was special. He's not special. He needs help too, like every other guy. There's a reason why there's Tom Brady, Joe Montana, Patrick Mahomes, and those guys are one of, and those guys are over here, and everyone else, Josh Allen included, are all over here. There's a reason. There's nothing wrong with being in the Joe Burrow, Josh Allen pool if you're Jalen Hurts. Hey, Jalen, sorry to break this to you guys. He's not into Brady and Mahomes' pool or the Aaron Rodgers' pool? Well, guess what? Who is? Aaron Rodgers was by far a more talented football player than Tom Brady. But who had the better resume? The guy who worked harder and the guy who studied longer. That's the key to this. How many times do you see lesser guys beating the superior guy? A lot. Hey, how does Baker? Hey, you know what I heard people say? Baker Mayfield's better than Jalen Hurts. Who in their right mind thinks that? Who really thinks that? That Baker Mayfield is better than Jalen Hurts? Who thinks that? Dude, I can't even lie to you and say that. Well, still, he had a better year, and he has better coaching. We need to build what Niners have. No, we can't. Khalid, you can't do what the Niners are doing. Take that out of your – you cannot build your team like the Niners. You know the Niners have two more years of this? They have two more years of this. Brock Purdy makes $870,000. Jalen Hurts will make more in one game next year than Purdy makes in a season. And he might win the Super Bowl. Brock Purdy might make more in the postseason in incentives and in postseason money than he made during the regular year. How's that possible? Because you struck gold. You struck gold with Brady. To some extent... Get this. This is what, and I know Tone and all you guys get on me for saying that they paid Jalen Hurts too soon. Why else did they fuck up by paying him too soon? Why did you, now, again, one of the things that helps this is the cap hits are incredibly awesomely done and structured correctly. So I might want to modify my take here a little bit. Okay, on that. And I will because the cap hits are not crazy out of the top, out of the, they're not going to like disrupt it. But you know what you do when you pay your guy too soon? You take all your leverage away and all your leeway and the latitude you give yourself financially to restructure contracts, to go and give Devontae Smith money, Landon Dickerson, to go and find some linebackers that, maybe may cost you a little more, or for some safeties and corners. When you pay your quarterback too soon like that, same with Wentz. You take that leverage away that you have in your contracts and in the fact that you have in your cap. And when you miss in the picks and the draft, all of that collides. You got to remember, it starts with the money. When you're constructing a a roster, it starts with the quarterback's pay. And then you work down from there. The 49ers have two years of this where they don't have to worry about a $50 million, $60 million. God forbid he wins it. If Purdy wins the Super Bowl this year, they don't pay him? Why would you? What's their best case scenario for the Eagles for the next few years, you think? They've got to have some restructuring mentally on how they're going to go about hiring. Dude, this starts with the coordinators first. I think that's the right thing, what they're doing here with these coordinators. 
You've got to get quality people in the building. But you know what else, too? The Philadelphia Eagles have to do one of the most important things that I don't know if they're capable of doing. And you know what that is? They've got to less, they've got to loosen up on the ropes a little bit. They got to loosen up on the micromanaging a little bit. Just back up a bit. Let these guys do what they need to do. Just back up. You know what I'm saying? Give them some space. Jason Cole's going to join us at 4.30. Um, I agree. If Hertz wasn't paid last year, they would have paid other spots. Again, though, but wait a minute. King Restaurant, remember this, though. You got to remember something about Hertz's contract, though. The cap hits are not. They're not catastrophic. Like, the Daniel Jones contract is catastrophic to the Giants' salary cap. I mean, that that contract they have with him, is, is, is re- that $40 million that they pay him, plus the hits on the cap that they have each year, dude, Jalen Hurts really is nothing. And it's really more of a three-year deal instead of a five-year deal. So it's not, however... When you do pay that money on March 16th or 17th, when the new NFL season kicks in, that money now is applied to your cap when it comes to his base. And the money you could have had, again, listen, it's not so much paying the kid. It's more this. Okay, you pay the kid and you miss on numerous draft picks and you get nothing out of your draft picks the last couple years. And all of that, Money you could have had between the A.J. Brown missing on the draft pick and having to go in free agent or having to go make a trade for him. You have to start with the money. When it comes to restructuring and redoing this, your, your, your salary cap right now is in chaos. Because half the team here, offense, all the money, defense, no money. And that's the result you had this year. Let's bring our friend Tone in for the sake here. Big sales, how are we doing, sir? <clears throat> People don't realize it starts with the money, man. Yeah, you know, Jalen Hurts' um contract, it's it's one of the more interesting contracts um out there because they're obviously paying him a lot of money, but the cap hits in and of themselves are definitely on the more favorable side. Completely um, team favor. Yeah, um, you know, just just to put it into perspective, <clears throat> so uh, the 2024 season, uh, he has a base salary of 1.1 million and a cap hit of 13.5 million. In 2025, a base salary of 1.1 million, cap hit of 21.7 million. In 2026, a 1.2 million dollar base salary with a 31.7 million dollar cap hit, and then 2027. Nothing. And then 2027 uh, is when it takes the bigger jump. The base salary is 1.3 million, and the and the cap hit is 45.8 million. And that's Still, why people don't realize the the signing bonus is not a pro not applied in that. Yeah, when he's talking so the base. Yeah, exactly. So in terms of the guarantees, uh, he's fully guaranteed 179.3 million dollars. Uh, they gave him the bag of money up, up front, front and they gave yeah. and they wanted the they wanted the base down where near a million something. Right. It's brilliant. So, that's right. So if we're if we're doing some math here. And that money, if I'm not mistaken, Tone, that 170, isn't it over three years? That 170, uh if if he he has an average salary of 50, 51 million a year. So the 179, if you disperse that. Over four years, that's about forty-four point eight million a year. So basically, uh, basically the guarantees include the twenty twenty-three salary, the twenty twenty-four salary, the twenty twenty-four option bonus, the twenty twenty-five salary, the twenty twenty-five option bonus, and three points and three point six nine million of the twenty twenty-six salary. So basically, you're guaranteeing him. You're basically guaranteeing him three years and some change. Yes, and and, 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 and on top of that, what yeah. what. Again, the beautiful thing is, is that the base is so low because that's the cap hit. 
Exactly. Exactly. Okay, and that to and, me, and that's the flexibility, and that's I, I the think, flexibility that you're getting. That, that because you don't. One thing the owner did right, and the GM did right. Here's the bag up front. Here, here, here's the bag of money up front. I want to ask you a question here. Yes. All right, Tone. Do you think that Nick Sirianni should be given the opportunity to dig himself out of this? He has seven weeks. I mean. What what could what, what can what could he do next season that he couldn't do in the seven weeks on offense? The personnel is not going to change. Coordinators are. That may that may be true, but because then that he proved the, it in twenty two. But then that argues, what's his value then at that point? You know, if if your success is hinges solely on your coordinators, what's your value? And that's why I'm and that's why I'm concerned if they decide to keep him. Here's why. Because if you do keep him and you do bring in some qualified co coordinators, basically what you're saying is Nick Sirianni agreed to take less control, to take a step back and allow the front office to make those decisions. Less power, less impact. Now we're questioning what his role is. Again, let's say those coordinators they come here a year, two years and they leave. We're back at square one with a guy that we have no faith in. So I don't understand the whole notion of uh, bringing Sirianni back, bringing in new coordinators, just so when they leave, we can keep, we, we can be right back to questioning his credibility again. Yeah, but Tone, I think the thing that got exposed this year wasn't Nick. I think his job description got dis exposed. Their process got exposed. You know, their process got exposed, and this has always been the process. You see, look at what they've done right now. They've taken the Doug Peterson playbook out on giving him an opportunity to go out and with Frank. And by the way, I think it's a brilliant stroke of genius by Nick. And this was Nick, by the way, from what I understand, reaching out to Frank, who somebody who somebody they respect in the front office and his opinions, who got two guys, two head coaching jobs last year. He is helping them. And helping him find these young coordinators and reaching out to them because Frank knows all these guys. Mm -hmm. Nick doesn't necessarily know all these guys. You know, he's a very young guy still in this business. Right. But at the end of the day, here, Frank is working. Now, I don't know if Frank is going to be the OC. I don't know that, but I do well, know. Well, hear me out on this. I'm glad you said they that. They are working with him and trying to find coordinators. Right. Listen to this. You know, we had we had uh, Rob Motti on on Sports Tech earlier. He's um, an AP reporter. They're you know they're uh, they're they're a lead reporter. Um, very credible. Um, really great at his job. He covered the Philadelphia Eagles for twenty plus years. Now he's down in Tampa. Um, we asked him about you know the dynamic between Nick and Frank and what it would look like if if Nick came back and the best what's the best situation. And you know he brought up the fact that look. You know, because I challenged him with the same thing that I said to you, right? Why bring in new coordinators if they're not going to be here for a, another year or two years after that? And then we're back to questioning Nick again. He said, that, he said, that's why I believe the right answer is Frank Reich. And in so many words, he basically said, Frank Reich, just from an age standpoint, from their relationship, that's the right move to make. And head coaching, get this. Here's the one thing you have to look in that dynamic for Frank coming back to the organization mm -hmm. and being a centerpiece like a Stoutland. He could be like a Stoutland in that organization. Here's why. How many NFL owners do you think are going to be knocking on the Eagles' door for Frank Reich being the next head coach after two failure places? Not anymore. Had, Not you anymore. Know, and, and, and that's not a thing. coordinator that could be uh -huh. in place for the next five years, and that would be the stability that Jalen needs. Correct. To be able Correct. to have coordinator in the building, knowing what to do and getting the proper tools around him and the organization trust his hires and recommendations. And that's my biggest concern. My biggest concern is stability. You know, bringing Nick back and bringing in some young coordinator, you know, for him to, you know, for him to listen to is just, I, I don't, I don't see this. Is, I don't see how that's sustainable. The most sustainable course of action, if they bring Nick back, is hiring older coordinators, guys that have been around the block already, guys that have had their opportunities, guys that are pretty set in, set in stone about where they want to be in their NFL careers. I think I loved your Leslie. I loved your I loved your Leslie um Leslie Frazier, Frazier pick. I love that. I loved what he was doing. He um, wants I back loved, in. 
Yeah, I loved what he was doing in Buffalo when he was there. He was there for what three or four years, and then he took time off, right? Five years and five the years. Last he three took time years, off. I love their was, defense under um, him. They were in the top five, right? And he also he also developed linebackers. He developed Matt Milano. Matt Milano's become a multi-time All Pro, if I'm not mistaken, a yes. Pro Bowler. So he helped develop Matt Milano. The Eagles need um somebody on that side that can help develop linebackers, and Matt Milano was a beast. I best believe that. Um, so yeah, I think. If they do bring it back, their coordinators have to be older. They have to be. If they're young guys, then we're going to be back at square one, and then it's just it's just going to be a you know a, a runaway train, a runaway train. It's, it's it's not going to get it's not going to get good. See on my um my oh yeah um, yeah, yeah yeah yep yeah you see Leslie Frazier yeah I also see Leslie Jones. <laughs> okay. You see Leslie Frazier right there. Yep. He wants back in. And he should. He should. Yeah. Now, that begs the question. I know him very well. And what a, a, a what are the odds? No shit guy, though. That, and, that's, and that's literally what I was about to ask you. What are the odds a guy like Leslie Frazier works in Philly? It, it, there, I, there I go answering my own question again. You know what? There I, there I go answering my own question again. <laughs> Here's something they got to go with Frank, though. They got to go with Frank. Here's something to, to think about with a guy like Leslie okay. Frazier. And, Tone, this is going to sound terrible. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. Kick my ass if I say it wrong or help me, okay? <laughs> He's black. Okay. How many opportunities do you think black coaches are going to be called to get head coaching jobs? where you can keep the guy in the building because why these owners don't like that look how long has leslie been in the league just as a coach forever years right because he, he used to years. play back in the day he used to play I think, right if i'm not mistaken i could have swore he was a head coach somewhere maybe i'm wrong mm -hmm. on that but get this how about this brian flores doesn't even have a job interview right you know did you did you hear that the uh the the falcons was interviewing brian johnson I'm like, I'm like, come on, dog. We 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 know what that is. <laughs> it's Rooney. I know what that is. You're going to hire Bill Belichick. Is a really great coach and a really great. Man. Okay, so Leslie was the head coach of the Vikings from 2011. Oh, that's that's right. That's right. 2013. Yep. He became interim in 2010, but he was their head coach from 2011 to 2013. Then became the DC in Tampa from 14 to 15, and never got another call to be another head coach ever again. Nope, never did. And it's been 10 years, 11 years now. Never. 11 did. years. Dude, do you know how good a coach that good man that man is? And Dude, he, he he's is, a, you know who he is? He's a younger version of Lovey. He's 64. He's 64 years old. He's not getting another call about uh no. So, so there's, I there's think, just what you're talking about right there. Age. That's and, and that's what I'm looking for. I, I want I want an OC in DC that's older. Another call for a head coach. Yeah, it, 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 it doesn't add up to me. And the thing is, though, you don't get too many. You don't get too many opportunities, right? And then you even the opportunities, that. and even the opportunities you get, they're not favorable. You don't have a quarterback. You don't have a defense, or I'll be like, it's you have to build from the you ground take, up. You get the shitty then, jobs. Yeah, and then all of a sudden, when you when you're not successful in two years, they're looking at you like you're a failure. It doesn't make any sense. You know, Jim Caldwell and Lovey had winning records when they were canned in Chicago and in Detroit. Lovey was ten and six in Chicago, and I think, and I and I, I and I and I think Jim Caldwell was that too in Detroit, and they got fired for winning records. Shit, I think if I'm not mistaken, Brian Flores, his last couple of years at Miami, he had winning records. Didn't Jim Caldwell coach the Colts at the Dundee? Yes. yes, yes, tremendous coach. You know, hmm. now that's an old school coordinator, and I don't think they'd be looking for anything like that. Right. But what what would you make of my my guys here too? Also, how about this? Cliff Kingsbury, uh, Zach Robinson, passing coordinator, Rams, mm. works for Sean McVay. Cliff Kingsbury makes me nervous. Why? Something about him. Something about him. What, I don't do you know. Think I, he's I, shady? I, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, look, I, I I have nothing. I, no, no. I, if I support, when you say, let me tell you something. When you say that as a guy, just. From 30,000 feet, and you're saying that if you said that to a player in the locker room, and I'd be because the first thing the player would players would go, Why you say that, Tone? We'd all be going like this. Why do you say that? And then we went, You think he's shady? And you go, Yeah, all right. He said, Hey, 
Because, man, we read that stuff like that. Yo, because I think he's shady a little bit, too. I, it's something about him, man. It's, it's, I, I feel it. The way, listen, all right, this may sound real petty. The way, okay, remember the year when the, um, remember the year when they drafted Kyler Murray, right? Because I think Kingsbury was the head coach, right? He was. They, they blew, he, so, he took the job. They blew out Josh Rosen. Right. Then they traded him to Miami. Then they it's, drafted Kyler Murray. I will never forget. On draft night, and you know how they always have the cameras set up, you know, in the war rooms, all that kind of stuff. This motherfucker was set up in this <laughs> well, you lavish like spread. Yo, he had this lavish ass all white room with the tall glass windows, I'm all white in the couch. background with a pool out there. So I the thought pool, it was a Chanel view. commercial. I was like, what the hell is this? No. Dude, it was like a, a, I, th I was waiting for a chick to come out of the pool going like, you know, yo, moving around. Like, I was like a Chanel commercial. I'm like, hold on, wait. Are you are you uh, trying to get in Vogue magazine or GQ? <laughs> or are you Dude, trying to... in the background with the snow on it. I was like, damn, this dude. You know who know. lives there now is Jonathan Gannon. The same house? <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan Gannon lives in that bitch now. There's huh. something about him, Sil. He just seems like a... Like a like a shyster, he seems shady. Oh, okay, okay, well, get this. Because you said that, he is completely off. My, I'm gonna go Frank. You know what? <laughs> I don't know, man. I think you know what, man. My guy tone goes like oh, this. Man. When he said shady and shifty, I'm like, okay, because I have a feeling of that too when I see him. What about the enemy? We all know he's not getting that job. I think the enemy should be considered for a head coaching job, but. Hell would freeze over before he got a head coaching job in Philly. And he's not taking another OC job unless unless he gets blocked again. Has he so, been fired in DC? No, they haven't fired anybody yet officially. Well, they fired Rivera. Yeah, they fired Rivera. He hasn't been fired yet. Not officially. No. That, I, I told people, I said, look, don't be surprised if they consider him for their head coaching job. It'd be an easy transition for them. And he proved that he could develop a quarterback. What if they he get that job to Bel no, Belichick's going to get that Atlanta job? Belichick's going to Atlanta. Yeah. He's going to Atlanta. Because That's Arthur Blank is going to give him complete control and get this. That means he's working with Rich McKay, who's been on my program. And I sent a text to Rich. I go, uh, how many times? Uh, Rich, what's going on? You know what Rich said? Close. You know what Bill wants? Can I tell you what Bill wants? What what is it? He wants Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson in Atlanta. You know, Sierra wouldn't mind that. Look at you. <laughs> Sierra wouldn't mind that. Uh, Sierra, Sierra would love Sierra Atlanta. Sierra wouldn't mind Atlanta. It's you, a great you, city. You, you think you think Sierra was letting his ass go to Pittsburgh? No. Right. So <laughs> Or Tennessee? No. Or to no. No, hey, hey, Sierra. Sierra, how you doing, honey? She, <laughs> she didn't even working. want. She, she didn't even want him in Philly. So. I saw her at the Super Bowl tone. I'm going to make this point to you. I have never in my life seen a more stunning or more beautiful woman in my life than that woman when she started walking towards us and she sat down with. I, I, I could not believe. <laughs> oh, crazy, C C dude! I don't, I've never seen a better looking woman in my life. Sills, here's what you gotta understand. Unbelievable. Sierra has been fine since Rock since since Rockware was Dude. was fire. She she's been fine since Baby Fat. She's been she's been fine since Sean John. Tony. You know when they when they was popping Chris Style. Cameras don't she's, do her justice. You gotta no, see her don't. in person. No, they Dude, don't. She's I um, never in my life have seen anything that stunning like that. I mean, she's. Dude, I'm telling you, man, I've never in my... Hey, you know what? Brady has Giselle. Sorry, nah, dude. No, nah, Giselle, Giselle ain't got shit on her. Giselle's Sorry. a baggage handler compared to that chick, man. <laughs> I mean, that ain't cut it, man. Holy well, yeah, God. man. But no, uh, well, now he, I'm trying to picture that. something like in that. In Atlanta. Something like Russell mm. Wilson, and he wants a veteran quarterback down there. So he wants a veteran because I, 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 know, I know some of his stipulations where he kind of wanted to work with the project. He didn't want something that was kind of ready made. He, he kind of wanted Scott something Smoley he could put his come down there and work with him too. Yeah, um, something who, something he could he put his own hand personnel on. people. Yeah. Now, 
And also, I think I think another reason he likes Atlanta, I think he likes the way that defense is constructed. Yeah. They've done they spent a lot of money in that defense the last offseason. Plus, they have and, the makings of a good running game. And my, yes, yes, they do. I think I think Atlanta is one of the best kept secrets. They have potential out of this. World. I think they could win the South next year with him. Yeah, all they need is a quarterback. If, if you put Russell Wilson with Drake London, Kyle Pitts, B. John, B. John Robinson, Robinson, and with, with, with that defense and their offensive line is decent, they can win. They could they can win the, uh, the NFC South for sure. And you know what? If you draft a kid Bowers, Ooh, so you think Georgia? they trade? So you think they trade Pitts? No, Pitts is he, not a tight end. Pitts is more of a slot guy. See, but, remember but something? He, when, I mean, he was he was drafted as a tight end, but you're yeah, right. They use him. Not really, and I'll tell you what Dan Mullen said about him. Yeah, Dan Mullen said, "Don't ever line him up on the strong side because he's not nah, a guy who can nah. handle physicality. He wasn't that when he was at Florida. So yeah. what you do is you line him you off the ball. Him. You got to line him up in trips. Well, you got yeah, you, gotta you have line him, him in weak side in the slot around the slot in there, and you line him up kind of like Kelsey. Yes, yes. Allow him to have free free release. And then you run that double tight end that they ran with Aaron Hernandez and with Gronkowski up in wait, New you England. You might be on to something. Could they be, could they draft Brock Bowers? Yeah, and have a, and have look, a and Bowers and bring, and bring back the double tight end sets with, like he did with right, Aaron Hernandez. And have Russell and, Wilson just throw into the two tight ends and plus your wideouts that you have down there too. Ooh, that sound, and they're all big bodies. Drake London is and, huge. And you have the makings, again, of a running game. And in a second and, and third round, you draft guys in the O-line. No, Sills, you might be on to something. That's I actually could, I think that's crazy. what he's envisioning is because there's the makings of a good running game. But you is Atlanta two, willing to take the money? Here, here's the thing. The money? Yeah, I think Arthur Blank is willing to take the Home Depot guy. Absolutely, because he wants to win. He, you know, he's in the he same Home Depot? Jerry Jones is in. He owns Home Depot? Yeah. Jeez. Arthur He's Blank good. owns Home Depot. Whew. Yeah, so Man. here, here's why you could turn that thing around quicker in Atlanta and why the Atlanta job's good. The owner's going to give you the money. He's going to give you the autonomy. You go double tight end set. Instead of going out and getting wide outs, double tight end set means you don't have to have high percentage turnover plays on chucking the ball down the field like the Eagles like to do. And you've got a better handle on contracts because tight end contracts, even though they are getting paid more money, they're not at wide receiver level. Fifteen million so, instead so, of twenty-five million. So if you build your def- if you build your offense around double tight end sets, you're going to always be ahead of the curve financially. Interesting. You might. Mm, that, that's I, what, I, New, I, I like, that's like what New England. Aaron Hernandez screwed everything up because they had, that double he tight end set like was him. something that nobody could defend. They couldn't stop it. They couldn't stop it. You know who the old pro tight end was first? It was Hernandez. Right. Remember, you, hey, before he killed that guy in South Florida, they gave him a contract extension. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if they probably would have won eight Super Bowls? Oh, God. They'd have they won were, three more. It was indefensible. They, they, they couldn't be defended. Couldn't too much defend size. It. Too much size with a combination of speed, route running hands. They were. Why they do were, you think the Patriots defended Aaron Hernandez as long as they did? To the bitter end. To the bitter end, which was when they finally you guys were going, he did it. You might not want to be on that limb. <laughs> he said and he they did went, it. Hey, okay, I guess so. They were the last person to say, dude. They were, hey, Tone. They were the last person to put their hand up and go, all right, he did it. <laughs> but I mean, the crazy thing about it is, Aaron Hernandez. They knew about him since college. They high school. They knew Aaron Hernandez was a guy that, listen, man, he's out there. He's in the mix. So. Let me go back to your boys now. Okay, let's do it. So your owner's sitting down in uh, the Caribbean having cocktails and Mai Tais. Mm-hmm. And I guess they're supposedly meeting and, you know. Do you think he flies them out? Or the no, or, or, or he comes back? Up and I think this is going to be a very interesting next couple days, seven days, six days, whatever this is going to be. Huh. And I think it's going to come down to this. They're looking at the vision, him working with Howie. This could be a setup like it was for Doug. I think personally this is either going to – remember something too. You bring him back, he is the coach that's on the hottest seat next – him and McCarthy. I agree. Are on the hottest seat if he comes back. Now, i got to give it to Jerry, and I'm going to tell you why bringing McCarthy back is the right thing. 
Agreed. I, I I I said that a lot of people don't a lot of people don't buy into that, but I think I think it's the right move. If Jerry Jones is fifty five years old, that's one conversation. When you're eighty one years old, and what was the record? They're thirty six and fifteen in the last three years. You're this close. The NFC is not really all that great right now. Anything can turn. You're as close as you're going to be. Why would you come in and bring up and do anything to kind of upset that? When at the end of the day, you got a ton of a ton of things to do in free agency. You got to re-sign a boatload of guys. And Tone, if this thing fucks up, I'll just hire Dion next year and I'll bring in Shador Sanders and I'll pass it off to my son. And I'll sit there and watch it and sitting there in the dad chair in the owner's box here. Because why wouldn't I? Because let me tell you what D'Amico Ryans has done. D'Amico Ryans has shown me. You know, if you understand the NFL and you understand the NFL player and you understand winning, I don't care who you are, okay? I see it done in basketball all the time. Guy's never had any kind of coaching experience whatsoever. Guy walks in there, all of a sudden Mark Jackson is turning the Warriors around. Mm -hmm. Mark never coached a goddamn day in his life. And you're sitting there going, what? Steve Kerr was kind of an assistant with Popovich in San Antonio a bit, but this guy did really, he was in the booth, right? He was in the booth with ESPN, and Correct. you're going like all of a sudden he goes. Now he's got one. Of, he's going to go to the Hall of Fame as a coach in the NBA. I and I think it's easier in the NBA. There's only five guys. There's 53. I get it, but still, I think that notion that an ex, ex NFL players, I think you take that away now. I think that you, D'Amico Ryan, shows me that you could walk in off the street here if you have a great understanding and a great knowledge of the game that you can move the sticks and you can move people and motivate people. Yeah. You know, uh, the Ryan's he's Ryan, he, he, he's such an interesting person because, you know, he played with the Philadelphia Eagles. He was a linebacker in the league. And Alabama he was, guy. And he always was um, a general on the field. You know what I mean? So he has that leadership quality. You know, what he's doing in Houston with C.J. Stroud and those guys, honestly spectacular. You know, when I think about things on the Philadelphia Eagles side, right, you know, Jeffrey Laurie and those guys, you know, I do you buy into do you buy into the stories that Nick and how we are out here scouring the faces of the earth for coordinators and coaches trying yes. to trying to prepare a, a presentation yeah, for it's, for Jeffrey more about Nick's. It's more about Nick's vision. Yes. So does that. So 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 is, does that imply does that imply how we needs Nick to come back? Because of everything we talked about before, remember how how we surviving three or four head coaching changes is not normal. So, do you think? Okay, let me ask you this: If how we had it his way, do you think he would want Nick Sirianni back, or do yes. you think he would want a new? Yes, no, I don't think he. No, no, so I don't think so he, I don't think he wants to fire him. Okay, you don't think he wants to fire him? Okay. No, I don't think he wants to fire him. Okay. I think the owner does. Mm. I think Howie has to show the owner that there's a pure vision. And quite frankly, I don't. I I think that there's, I think. See, I'll, I'll take that back. I think the owner's waffling on hiring, firing him or not. Because here, Tone, you and I know this, and you just getting new into the business. But I think you've gotten a really great grasp of how media works. Uh, the Eagles do not like to let things hang out there at all when it comes PR wise. I mean, you were telling me this, Sills. They do. They do fumble drills every day. And I go, yeah, well, they ain't putting them on their website every day and doing up yeah. downs. And, 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 and look, when you, when you, when you challenge me on that, right? Size fired. And you're going like, <laughs> well, wait a minute. They got ahead of that firing because they put a theatrical play on because mm -hmm. they wanted to show the authority that Nick had. Okay. Mm -hmm. They like getting ahead of stuff. Yeah, they very don't much want to so. be behind. For very them much. to allow this story to, I mean, if they didn't think, or if they didn't want this out there, hey, personally, all these leaks, I think it's the Eagles. You said it, not me, because I think. Why I wouldn't think, they stop yeah, it I, and go, Nick's our guy? Who said listen, it was? I'm so glad you said that. We, we, we were talking about this with Rob Mighty on, on Sports Take. Harry Roseman has made a career out of manipulating and controlling the narrative. He cares about that. They no, care about how they look. Coach for media, exactly. They, 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 they. He cares about how he looks in situations. He cares about the optics. He cares about the perception. They care about that tremendously within the Eagles organization. 
if they had if there was any sign or any fragment of their spirit that felt like Nick Sirianni was being unjustly criticized, they would have said it. They would have said it. And they would have said, no, he's our guy. We're committed to him. And they would move past this. But they know for a fact that everyone's right in the fact that his job is not safe. And rightfully so. They want Man. that hanging out tone. Or they would, they would, look, the players have come and said something. And, and dude, I don't know if it's true or not. Somebody said that they edited it out or whatever it was where they edited the endorsement. I mean, I don't know about you here, man. Wait, but wait, all I'm going to is that if the Eagles wanted that to go away, they could have made that go away yesterday. But for some reason, they're allowing that narrative. All these reporters going in on every day, listening, talking, interviewing. Nobody in the organization is endorsing anybody. I mean, you, and get this, to a point that I'm going to get to you here, I wonder, now this is just me and a conspiracy theory. This is, Ooh. I'm going to say it, okay? I wonder if the owner and the GM and the agent, Nicole Lynn, are not endorsing Nick because management has made it clear we're not endorsing anyone yet and we'll let you know what we do here because Jalen Hurts, this has gone on how many days? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. It's four days. He has not endorsed him. Nope. <clears throat> now, you had four days to go, I'm not. Nick Sirianni is my guy. Instead right. of watching, this is how he's answering it. What? I didn't know that was a thing. Um, what? What did I say? He's, he's being very coy about it. And, and, and guess what? I was He's watching not. a video of Jeff Kerr. What what I say? I was like, "Come on, son." He's I he don't knows buy what he's shit, Listen, man. Jalen, no Jalen, better than that. Jalen is an intelligent individual. He's very calculated. He's very privy to his brand. He's very privy to relationships. He's very he, he's very manicured and meticulous in what he says and what he gives to the media and what he does not. He does not waste any words. Jalen hurts has not endorsed Nick Sirianni because he does not want Nick Sirianni to be his head coach. I firmly believe this. I firmly believe that Jalen, I firmly believe Nick Sirianni's future hinges on Jalen Hurts' endorsement. I firmly believe that. But, but, but Tone, so, okay. Because, because he, listen, you always say follow the money. They put a quarter of a billion dollars into this kid based off potential. They'll be damned. If they let a guy like Nick Sirianni come in and ruin that potential, think about that—a quarter of a, a quarter of a billion dollars. They saw what happened with Wentz. They can't afford to let that happen again. Let me ask you this, okay? That being said, so they're going to go against conventional wisdom, and they're going to go against their mo. And you think he has say on the next head coach and on the next? Offensive coordinator, when that's an organization that really doesn't – they didn't listen to Doug. They didn't listen to Andy. They didn't listen to any of those guys. But all of a sudden, is it may, maybe the money has changed that dynamic in it. And it, it could the money, have easily. The money's, the money's gotten bigger. I, I'm not saying that wouldn't. Right. But what I'm saying is you really think an organization who likes to do things themselves and thinks they empowered themselves – and that this is all them is going to turn around and give a player saying who the next guy is. Listen, I don't know. I think that's a reach a little bit. Hey, listen, that's what we're here to do, right? We're here to reach for the stars. Oh, yeah. uh, dude, this is a, this is the absolute <laughs> show of reach arounds. Uh, <laughs> but no, I, I really believe I, I really believe it because if 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 okay. If Jalen comes out and he did say, yeah, you know, Nick is my guy. You know, we had a rough year, you know, but I think I think we can make a comeback. You know, he's my guy. I, I, I really believe we want to be talking, having this conversation. I really believe that Jalen Hurts has has not gone out his way to go above and beyond for Nick Sirianni. Uh, in any way, uh, what? and he's had in, days. In, in, in any way, shape or form, after that game, especially right after the game when the emotions are raw, he could have said, "No, no, he's he's our guy." Like, what do you what do you, what do you mean? And you, and look, he could, he could have said it in his own way. You know what he says? Oh no, I, you know I I support everybody. 
I support Brian. I support, you know, Matt Patricia. I support that's you know, a thing. Tulo, Nick. That's you know, a it's thing. like it's like, oh, it's, it's like, oh, yeah, you of course, yeah, you support everybody. Okay, I, I support everybody. What does that mean? So again, um, I, I think I think they've probably had or are having conversations with Jalen Hurts to figure out what how he feels about this whole thing. Because again, that's the investment. That's that's the money. You said it, you said it yourself. I I I care I, 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 I care more right. about Remember you said about the uh, about the Niners, right? They care more about money loss than losing the picks for Trey Lance. Yeah. They the the Brock Purdy drafty uh drafting saved them from a financial standpoint and they look at it as okay, well I mean draft picks they come and go, but money that can set you back for for for, for years. Absolutely. So so in this situation because it sets your cap back. Exactly. They guaranteed this they guaranteed this young brother uh north of 170 million dollars ton of dough and you mean to tell me his opinion is moot i'm not buying that the way nicole lynn moving in these streets i'm not buying that she's brilliant she's brilliant really brilliant. i'm not brilliant. buying it dude i'm more impressed with the quentin williams deal she put together two of the quietest deals in it i mean she and put about then, 700 million dollars worth of deals together and i didn't even hear anything about it and go and quentin williams was signed to the all-time number for defensive tackles yeah jalen hurts kept 51 million dollars Holy shit, I heard no noise. Exactly. And then it makes it even more worse when you couple it with the fact that, hold on, wait, Shane's here for two years. Shane leaves. All of a sudden, Hurts has this massive drop-off. This team loses six of their final seven games. Some of, some of, some of this drop-off is inexplicable. You have 2,000-yard receivers and a 1,000-yard running back, a top, five, a top five offensive line. You can't score more than nine points? Something is wrong here. Here, I don't think Hertz believes Nick Sirianni is the guy to bring him to the top of where he wants to be. I, I don't think he believes that. Okay, let me let me fair, and 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 the money. I because I look, I always start with the money because you have to when we're talking NFL because of the salary cap and because mm -hmm. of turnover every year. You have to, especially when you have a football team. See, the Eagle, the Eagle salary cap is in chaos right now. It's a complete chaos because of the other side of the ball. It's not, dude, you're not, I want to show you something here, Tone. So the amount of money, and I'm not talking cap, I'm talking money that you're spending. This year, starting in March, Jalen gets 50, around that number. Mm -hmm. Your wide receiver gets 21. They're 71. You've got two tackles north of 16 million. That's 32. That's 102. Let's just say Kelsey comes back. That's another 15. That's 170. Hoss, your cap is 220 million. How are you going to pay on that side of the ball and justify? With an 18% increase in the salary cap, only being able to spend $70 million on your defense, you're lucky you have your two D tackles in um in rookie deals. Your corners are 30 million. Get this. I had just the corners, Tone. You're at 230. Mm -hmm. The cap is 228. Right. That's what it's being projected at. Yeah, they don't have they don't have much flexibility, right? Because I'm, I'm looking at their situation right now for the 2024 salary cap, and <clears throat> the, the reality is, um, their estimated cap space going into 2024 is 28.5 million, right? But here, but here's the thing: that 28.5 million is going to disappear quickly if you find if you if you feel the need or desire, or you try to get Kelsey or Fletcher Cox back. That's going to like. That's going to be but, gone. But also this. So, okay, H how are you dealing with the construction of the contracts at the corner position? All right, I'm with you. By the way, I'm 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 agreeing with you. Basically, saying they have almost no flexibility here. You have no money except for this because of the misses in the draft. In the cap and being a balanced cap, you understand what he's done here, is that he pushes chips in on twenty two. And this is why, Tone, I told you you're a five-win team in two years because he does not have any flexibility 
And the only thing he did that was really of significance that was great is the Hurts cap hits. Mm-hmm. That 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 gave them that saved them a little bit. Did you know Hassan Reddick has the uh, the largest cap hit in 2024? His cap hit is 21.3 million. There's your entire salary cap. That's, how that, are you getting how are you paying the other nine guys? That's that's eight that's eight point seven percent of the total cap. Lane Johnson cap hit 16 million, which is six point six percent of the cap. Kevin Byer cap hit 14.2 million, which is 5.82. What's Milata? Uh Jordan Milata, he has a 10.7 million dollar cap hit, which is not bad at all. Um but it yeah, all adds up, though. It's all, it's, it's all going to add up. Jalen Hurts has the thirteen point five million dollar cap hit. Um, How about see, AJ? AJ Brown's cap hit is twelve point four million. Twelve point four. When you think, see, when you look at it like that, some of these caps hit cap hits aren't terrible, but it's how it's allocated. It's how it's, it's That's where the money right. is sitting. Because it's on one side of the ball. It's, it's on one side of the ball. It's 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 really on one what side of the, the ball. What are the two corner cap hits? Okay, here James Bradbury's cap hit. Let's see here. So <clears throat> James Bradbury's cap hit in twenty twenty four will be four point eight million. Not horrible. Not horrible. Um, his dead cap hit is seventeen point two though. Can't move him. So, but he's he was so bad. Dude, you're what not you... putting 17 on your cap with that's dead cap money. <laughs> Are you fucking oh, kidding me? No, so I, he was I, so I, bad this, though. You know what I'd rather do? I'd rather pay him and send him home. Darius Slay, listen to this. Darius Slay has a 10.9 million dollar cap hit with a 35 million dollar dead cap hit. He's not going anywhere. That's 45 million dollars that you have to get this. It's almost Tony, this is crazy, but it's almost worth paying them and sending them home. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. I'm no, not paying 35 you million have, in another. Yo, you have north of 50 million dollars in dead cap in those two dudes. But in those two dudes, no way they're cutting both of them. Can't. And no. And by the way, I guarantee you they're not restructuring. Why would they? Why would you? Would you? No. <laughs> Shit, I wouldn't. Three years old. This is my last big money. I'm not getting. Right. I'm not getting another contract like this in the open market. I ain't giving you nothing back. I'm not giving – right. Hey, you want to be um, uh, one of those get, give her back guys? Hey, get this. You got the wrong dude. Hey, get this, man. At Consolidated Garbage, that's Big Sills' company. No deposit, no return. I don't, I, don't, I don't give you any return on your deposit here, man. And you this, put the and money this, in, it's mine. And this goes back to the, 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 the crux of all this. They have to hit on these draft picks. That's right. They, they lost to. all leverage and latitude. And, oh, do you think that idea, because of the lack of flexibility cap-wise, because they are really depending on these ca- on these draft picks to hit, do you, think it's, do you think it's plausible that Jeffrey Lurie just says, look, we need a lot of stuff to go right, Howie. I can't let you have I can't let you have all this power. We need a lot of things to go right right now. And I can't afford That's to put all my eggs in your basket. Because get this, I you know what could be being done behind the scenes too? Could this be a possibility? Is he not only just evaluating Nick Sirianni, but is he also the reason that he's having these two guys work together? Because he evaluating both Looking, of them. Is he evaluating Howie? Yes. Yes, because, I agree. Yeah, yes. I mean, I don't think that that's being reported enough is that aren't both guys responsible for the mess that happened here? And if that's the case, isn't Jeffrey Lurie going to go like this? Let's see how these two guys want to fix this and clean this thing right. up. Let's, let's see me, the game plan. I'll make a better assessment on what guy I think I'm going forward with. Isn't this what he did with Howie and Doug? Mm-hmm. Didn't he look at it and choose Howie? And he sent Doug away. I wonder if he regrets that move today compared to that. that because mm-hmm. doesn't it look right now like he's doing the same thing and he's not going to let Tone history repeat itself again because he chose. Now, look, he can also go like this. Hey, he did put us in a Super Bowl last year. 
Right. I mean, Tony, I think this, I think he's doing this because this is the Doug Peterson handbook. Who am I going to go with? Am I going with Nick? Am I going with Howie? Am I going with both? Can they I think both in, coexist? I think in I think in either circumstance, regardless how it goes down, I think Harry Rosen is losing power this offseason. I think regardless of what happens. And I think and not in contracts. No, 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 no. That's his forte. I'm more so talking about personnel, drafting. I wouldn't be surprised if regardless of the circumstance, Nick comes back, Nick gets fired, whatever. I think Harry Roseman's control, I think his grip is gonna have I think his grip is gonna loosen this offseason. How about this, Tone? What's more what's been more detrimental to the success of the Eagles? The analytics department or the personnel department? Personnel. Because because um I go I go back to your point that you made a couple of days ago, or was it yesterday? I can't remember, but you made a point about, and I actually I made the point earlier as well. It's so important to have a balanced salary cap. And the only way you can balance it properly is if you're hitting on your draft picks and you're getting top-notch production or or at least competent production from guys on rookie deals. And that's why, believe it or not, that's why the Bills got back in motion because they had a lot of injuries on defense, and they and they were still trying to figure it out. But once they figured it out and figured out everyone's role and everyone settled in, that defense got way better. That's why so, Baltimore has been a stable franchise. That's why Baltimore's been for stable. the last twenty years. And look at that's, San Francisco, what they've been doing since Lynch got there. That's why they've Buffalo's been, been stable. Their cap. Yeah, and so they. That's why to your question, I think personnel decisions have been the biggest downfall because you have not hit enough of your draft picks. You have not developed enough guys to where as though you can get max production on a rookie contract, which will give you flexibility and you won't be forced to spend money in free agency. It, it, it ties you up. You, you, you brought that to my attention and I never really gave it much thought until you, in, until you, until you laid it out the way you did. And it's so important to maximize your draft picks and get, get something out of those guys. Cause of the money you don't, because if you don't, you're going to try to plug that hole elsewhere. And how else do you do it? Free agency or Free trade. Agency. And now at that point, you're leveraging assets that you, that can be used elsewhere to try to fill one spot. Whereas if you draft a guy, you know, no harm, you're no foul. You're not dealing with a full deck. Not, yeah, yeah. So, you're not, um, but, Tony, you're not using all the tools in your toolbox right. when you're GM when you're doing that. Exactly. The key is this. Hey, you want to draft some starters. You want to hit. You want to get some picks especially at the premium positions where get this these guys are going to get three years on a rookie deal which means i'm paying them nothing and look these the, guys look, are productive look at the and if there's some holes i need to fill i can go find some holes to fill and i don't want to spend 25 here kansas city is a great example of that in my opinion kansas city did not want to pay tyree kill the 25 million dollars you know what they did they retold their defense Mm -hmm. And now their defense is going to be a world-class defense for the next five years during the Mahomes era. Mahomes needs a great defense. Don't get him some pieces in the offseason. But here they are again, now in a divisional round, going to Buffalo. Tone, I mean, it's balancing your cap exactly. and being and getting the maximum that you can possibly get. Look at the two corners they have right now. Get this. They didn't want to pay the Honey Badger. They didn't want to pay some other guys on that team. They got rookies that – Corner position. Do you understand what that means? You're they listening. got two corners making two million dollars a piece. You have two corners making thirty million dollars combined. Listen, I'm about to I'm about to blow your mind for a second. So <laughs> this is this is this is about to get funny. So Kansas City, right? You know, we talk about balancing the salary cap, right? Kansas City, Patrick Mahomes, his cap hit for 2024 is fifty seven point three million, right? That's his cap hit. And I'm good with that. But right, 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 right. It's Patrick Mahomes. Why wouldn't you be, right? So keep that in mind. 57.3 million. That's 23% of your total salary cap, right? Now listen to this. <clears throat> Their offense as a whole, 158 million cap dollars. That's $158 towards the cap. Their defense, which is their best group. Guess 
how much money they spend on the side of the ball in 2024. Just guess. Well, Jones makes 20. And I can't think of anybody else on that defense that makes any, maybe the linebacker. I can't, I can't really see anybody on that other side of the ball outside of Jones making money. As of right now in 2024, and of course they probably got some moves to make, got some signings to do. You know, you got free agents you got to take care of. But as of right now, did you know Kansas City on defense has a total cap hit of 51.7 million? That is on. And guess where that ranks in the NFL? Number one. 30, well, 31st. Well, <clears throat> so. Yeah. Yeah, thirty first. So second. So, so that they they they, had the, they spend the second lowest amount of money on defense, and they have a top five defense. That and my, that is the that is the definition of hitting on your draft picks completely, and making a tough choice to move off of Tyree Kill. Right. And Do you, you understand yourself, those two things? Cohen. Here's the things that coincided. Watch, you moved off Hill, you hit on your picks, mm -hmm. and you're winning. All those things are beneficial. Get this. They may not win it this year. I don't know. They may. They may not win it, right? However, their Super Bowl window now opens up for another four years. Because of that defense and that quarterback. Because of the way they allocated the money and resources. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what I'm talking about Roseman doesn't do. And that's that Jeff Kerr comment again, Tone. And guess what? It's not success. It's sustainable because right. of the way he does business. And guess what, right? We wouldn't even be we wouldn't even be having this conversation really if he hit on the picks. If he hit on the or got picks. any production out of them. Right. We wouldn't be having this conversation if he got production out of the out of the draft picks. See, look, again, people just looked at it on the on the outside and just looked at it like, you know, in the simple look, oh, he missed on Rager when it came to Jefferson. That's not really what he missed on. It's bigger he than missed that. on the leverage of a couple years, three years of a rookie deal and the production of the player. Look at what Minnesota got. Think about that. Minnesota got a superstar player and three years of a rookie deal. What do you think they did with their cap? Mm. I mean, dude, anytime you get something like that is a gold mine. Oh, listen to this. Listen to this. I'm about to blow your mind again. On defense, right? The Philadelphia Eagles in 2024 in total cap dollars, total cap hit for the whole team. Remember, I told you Kansas City's, right? Kansas yeah. City's total cap hit was 51.7 million for their whole defense. And they're a top five defense. The Philadelphia Eagles have a total cap hit for their defense at a $108.5 million. And they were the worst defense in the NFL. And tell everyone else what Kansas City's was. Kansas City spent half of that at fifty one point seven million for their uh, for their defense in twenty twenty four. Now let's let us let us add context. Let's let's go to twenty twenty three, right? Let's make it more accurate because twenty twenty three is the season that just ended. So let's update it to twenty twenty three and let's just talk about what they paid for in twenty twenty three, okay? Because because with the numbers I'm giving you is for twenty twenty four. So so all right. <clears throat> On the 2023 roster, the Chiefs. This is actually more damning for the Philadelphia Eagles, actually, in my opinion. So, in 20 for the 2023 season that just ended, right? The Chiefs had a total cap hit of 75.5 million dollars on defense, right? So, hold that in mind: 75.5 million on defense for Kansas City. For the Eagles on That's defense, because of the restructuring one-year deal of Jones, right? Exactly, exactly. But hear me out on this. So, so seventy five point five million for KC on defense in twenty twenty three. For the Eagles, they spent seventy four million. So, my point in saying that is, they spent the same amount of money on defense. Yet, Kansas City has the top five defense, and the Eagles have a bottom five defense. What's the common denominator? Poor drafting, and the money spread out across the backfield, the linebackers, and the D line. And you have balance on that side of the ball where you don't have balance on your side. You have mercenaries. You see, mm -hmm. again, they're not going to have massive turnover in Kansas City over the next three years. Philly will. And oh, also, I got to get going here. I got Jason yep. Cole coming up. Oh yeah, that's right. That's right. Listen, man. Look, we could talk. We could talk for hours about hey, this shit. I so, got it, man. Listen, I, I, got I, it. I appreciate you, man. It's Interesting always fun. times, my friend. I Interesting love it. Times. I appreciate Content. it. Thank you, my friend. Let's that is it. tone.
Jason Cole's going to join us. We're going to talk about some of these divisional games and some of the things going on in the NFL. Hit the like button. Keep it here, National Football Show. and Hooters, the perfect pair. Any professional sports coach will tell you there's no substitution for preparation. At Malamut & Associates, that is a tenet by which we live. We prepare from day one for victory. Anything less is not acceptable. Underdog Fantasy has a way for you to play alongside your favorite football team all season long with their Fantasy Pick'em game. You pick between two to five players, select whether they'll go higher or lower on one of their stats, then do what you usually do on a Sunday, watch the games. You can win up to 20 times your money in a single game by going five for five. It's a fantasy game, and the sports betting show wants you to get involved. Go to underdogfantasy.com. When you sign up, use the promo code WIN, and Underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. differentiate between being a head coach and a coordinator. I mean, I go over to my Twitter page at Dan Cilio show. Wasn't Frank just fired? Yeah. Being a head coach is completely different than being a coordinator. I mean, what, why is that so difficult to separate? And you're being asked to help in coordinators and something that he's proficient at is being a really great coordinator. Philip Rivers is, do you, do you know why this makes even more sense? Because Jalen Hurts loves watching Philip Rivers film. And the most productive years that Philip Rivers ever had as an NFL football player were with Frank Reich. We're not asking him to be the head coach of the Eagles. Separate it. His previous two jobs have nothing in common or anything to do, nothing to do with what's being asked to him. Nothing. Zero. How are you tying that in? They're looking for quality coordinators around the league. Okay, you, hi, you go to a guy who the organization respects, helped win you a Super Bowl, 
Got the best, like LJ said, out of Carson Wentz. I mean, how stupid are you? It makes no sense. Okay, think about this too. It's somebody Jeffrey Lurie reveres. And I got to tell you something else. Tone, I forgot to put this out there. Frank did you a favor. You owe him. He took Wentz off your hands. And he convinced Chris Ballard and the Colts. I think that's what got Frank fired more so than anything in Indianapolis. Was that he got Carson Wentz off the hands of the Eagles. I did him a favor. So people say that crap, don't know football. Remember that. You only had to eat one year of that deal. Shit, the Colts and the, and the commanders had to eat a little bit of that contract. They got you out from that. Frank did that. And he gave you Shane Steichen and Gannon and Sirianni. I mean, why wouldn't you call that back? Hey, Frank, what do you think? Well, here's some coordinator ideas. Let's call them up and see what they want to do. You know, all these coaches that are going to be available for a potential. And Chris Ballard, too. Absolutely. The job openings right now. And by the way, it, it's it's kind of interesting to see some of these job openings. And I want to add, and before I bring Jason Cole in here, it's funny how people look at Belichick in his last five years in New England, and you look at Mike Tomlin. Mike Tomlin, since he won a Super Bowl, has an under 500 record in the postseason. Some go, well, look at the quarterbacks. Well, look at Bill's quarterbacks the last three years. What's the difference? Is it because of the level of success he had? Or is it because you look at Bill differently because Bill's an asshole? I, I think Bill in Atlanta working with Rich McKay would be an interesting dynamic. I do. And there's a lot to hit on right now. And let's bring our friend Jason Cole in. And, you know, I'm not sure, Jason, I've ever seen more quality guys that are out there that have potential of landing in places. H have you ever seen anything like this? Uh, Belichick, Harbaugh, Carroll. Um, yeah. And then you got Ben Johnson, who's out there, who looks pretty good um, as a young guy. Uh, no, never seen it quite like this. Um, you know, if Tomlin was to play it out and not take the extension, he'd be on the market next year. Um, he'd certainly be in high demand. Did you think uh, that was a real story, Jason Tomlin leaving? No, I, I never, I never quite. I think that that was a lot of speculation, not understanding who the people are, especially who the Steelers are. The Steelers are all about consistency. And if you know Art Rooney the second, he's very much like his father. Yeah. Very patient, you know, understanding. Now, I think that there's, re I think Art Rooney the second is going to look at Mike and say, Mike, what we're doing on offense is not good enough. And you need to have a real plan. We need to have a real coordinator. We can't go with guys like Matt Canada. You know, we have to we have to understand what are we really doing here. Um, but Mike's not an illogical guy. And as long as you don't show him up publicly, I think he's going to be fine with that. And Art Rooney II is not the kind of guy who's going to show up his coach. So I never thought, like, I, under, I, I just was like, really? People think Tomlin's out? Like, I, I never like did. No, I mean, you know, you remember back to the Chuck Noll days, the end of the Chuck Noll era, 
was a long time, right? Like they give him a lot of years to try and figure it out and fix it. Um, now Chuck won four Super Bowls, so he deserved he deserved more leeway. But to the point, Jace, they've only had three coaches in '69. It's not like they make that move. They give coaches a chance it's to not, fix it's the not issue. Their, it's not their. It's not their. It's way. not their mo. Right. So they, you know, it's like the Giants. The Giants don't have an mo of just changing co coaches, you know, like that. Now they have occasionally, but it's not what they want to do. They want consistency. You look at what Baltimore is, has done. You've had really basically two coaches in 25 years. I think if you go back to Billick, I mean. They're looking for consistency. This is not the Dave Tepper world of the NFL. I, I completely agree here. And I want to take you to Philly now. Um, see, to me, Philly's interesting because if Philly wanted this story to end, they all they'd have to do is the owner would have to just come out and say, hey, look, he's our guy. I mean, just like the same way Jerry Jones came out, and we'll talk about that in a bit here about McCarthy, but he came out and said he's coming back. Now the Eagles can easily say that, so I'm led to believe. Have that they ever? But have they ever done? That? I, but this is where I'm going with it. I think they're doing the Doug Peterson playbook here, and they're giving this thing a week to assess both Howie Roseman, the GM, and uh -huh. the head coach because they made the same decision in 2020 what they were going to do, and Lori picked Roseman. Roseman did a poor job this year at retooling that defense. And it was terrible in the coordinators this year as well. So, do you think that job is still in play? Look, I would keep Roseman. I, I, I don't know. Look, their personnel was fine. Dude, that uh, defense was terrible. They were the worst well, defense in the I, NFL the last eight games of the year. I understand the last eight games. But they were fine in the first, in the first nine. Okay, they they have some guys who need to get more mature and ready, like Jordan Davis. Jordan Davis is a good player, but you know he had a wall. Jalen Carter for it's called the White game. Castle wall. Well, that's part of the problem, right? Things got to get taken care of. And the the philosophy of what Howie is trying to do is not wrong. The execution of it didn't work out this particular year. But when you look at what Howie's trying to accomplish, Howie's got the right concept. You know, the the Forty Nine ers have the same concept. Be really good. You know, on defensive line, you know, fill in your offensive line where you can. Now, I would say Philly's offensive line has more guys, you know, across the board. Yeah, they have more guys who are good players, whereas San Francisco's got one great guy and four, four guys who are, you know, technically, you know, sharp, but not superior athletes. So it's, I mean, it, but the basic philosophy is be good there. So Howie's got the right idea. The issue is Sirianni, and I would give the guy another chance because he's been a good coach. It's like Fletcher Cox said yesterday, what are you talking about? We made the playoffs, you know, three years in a row. Got to a Super Bowl, you know. He had seven bad games, you know, here. Fix what was the – go to Sirianni and go, what was the problem in the second half of this season that it got out of control and got out of the way? And is some of that your own hubris, you know, Nick? Like, are you just too full of your yourself and you needed to get beaten down a little bit to fi figure out what the problem is? Or do you relate to the players? What Fletcher Cox is telling me is that Sirianni still relates to the players. Did he make some mistakes, you know, on the, on the offensive and defensive coordinator front? I mean, look, he had to hire two new guys. You lose two guys to the to other other you know, teams, it's a, it's a problem, but I, I don't think you just trash Nick Sirianni because of that. Um, you, you change your coaches when you've run the table as long as you can with an Andy Reed, or you have figured out that Chip Kelly's system is a complete and total fraud in the NFL, which is what happened. So you're under the, you're under the notion you believe that this guy should be giving an opportunity to right the ship. Absolutely. That's a good coach. I mean, that's, that's a guy who knows how to win. Is, is he perfect yet? No. How old is Sirianni? 40 something years old. Yeah. Something in their low, low forties. Yeah. I mean, like, did you, did you expect he was going to be Don Shula? No, <laughs> no, no. I mean, 
Right. And even Don Shula wouldn't be Don Shula today. So give it a little time. Now, if he doesn't fix the problems, then it's another discussion. But for right now, let's see if he can fix the problems and, and understand what the problems are. Are you surprised the Cowboys brought Mike McCarthy back? No, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I'm not either. Not. I thought it was, again, like, what does Jerry want? He's 36 want... and 15 in three years, and he's 81 years old. He's not changing a, that out when you're that close. A, not that close. B, when Jerry's had coaches that he couldn't control, they did well. I'm not saying that. Jerry, Jimmy Johnson, you know, set the table, you know, won two titles and set the table for a third, right? Bill Parcells made them as good as they've been at any point since the Super Bowl years, right? Yep. Two, two great guys. He couldn't deal with it. Jerry couldn't deal with get acquiescing to those guys. And do you think that anybody else is going to come in, whether it's a Belichick or a Harbaugh, and are going to say, "Oh, cool! You go do your press conference in the in the in the locker room every freaking game." Nobody's doing that. Who's a quality coach? Nobody's acquiescing to Jerry, and Jerry wants to be acquiesce. He wants to be the guy in control. So he's not going to change out if he thinks he's going to win. That's why they stayed that long with Jason Garrett. I mean, we think that they're he's being patient with with you know Mike McCarthy. How many years did he last with Garrett when it was just like 500 after 500 after 500? How about this, Jason? Do you allow Dak Prescott to go into the final year of his contract without dealing putting a contract together? Or do Probably you, not. You think they'll redo him? It's, what is it, $58 million? Yeah. It's a lot of money on your cap. He's a good player. It's a, you can win a Super Bowl with Dak Prescott. So you you can you you believe the Cowboys can win a Super Bowl with McCarthy and Dak? I think they can. Okay, and, and this is where I go. It's it's sort of like you remember the Brad Johnson led, and I say led Bucks. Bucks. Can you win a Super Bowl with Brad Johnson as your quarterback? I would have said never. <laughs> right, but they did. They did. Right? Yes, they did. Because everything else was perfect. Yep. Okay. Well, Brad Johnson's not as good as Dak. Dak's better than Brad Johnson. You got a chance. Now, is the difference is does Dak Prescott make you a Super Bowl contender year after year after year? Well, the answer we already know is no. Okay, he doesn't, he's not one of those guys who raises the level of everybody around you. There ain't that many of those guys. In fact, we've had a bunch of them just retire. Yeah. Right. Tom Brady did that. Peyton Manning did that. To a certain extent, Eli Manning did that. You know, even Philip Rivers, even yep. though he never won a Super Bowl, made you a contender year after year. Right. Aaron like Rodgers. Guys, Aaron Rodgers, you know, and he's still in the league, but there just aren't that many. So you got to live with what you have. It's like the people in, in, it's like the people in Miami, you complain about Tua, and I get it. I understand you don't want to pay all that money and, you know, you worry about this and you're like, but. Like, how were you from two, the year 2000 to 2020? Did you have a good time? Were you singing the Dolphin Fight song, you know, a whole lot of times? Are you not sport? a fan of Chad Pennington? <laughs> I love Chad Pennington, but he doesn't make you a Super Bowl contender. Come on now. I mean, the arm wasn't good enough, right? Dak can. So Tua can. Are you still drafting other quarterbacks? Am I always looking at Dak and going, look, Dak, until you put a bunch of pelts up on the board, I'm drafting a quarterback in the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh round. I'm bringing in guys. I'm looking for a, a Brock Purdy. I'm looking for a Tom Brady. You're not, you're not sacred, okay? But you're the guy. I, you're the guy I'm rolling with right now. I mean, again, New England. They paid Drew Bledsoe. They did the year that the year that he got hurt. They paid Drew Bledsoe a whole lot of money. One seventeen, right? They found this kid named Brady, and we're like, "That's good. I'll take that." And it worked out. Reports are now, Jason, that it looks like uh, Belichick 
unless things go sideways, will be working with Rich McKay and Arthur Blank uh -huh. in Atlanta. What do you make of that move for Bill going down there? And where it is, too, one of the things is that he wants to bring Scott Pioli in, help him in the personnel department, because Scott helped him up with when Casario and Pioli were up in New England early on in the process of building New England. And they're looking at bringing some personnel folk in. And there's a conversation potentially of trying to seem seemingly somehow try to get a veteran quarterback. Is that Russell Wilson? I don't know. But they're looking at doing something like that. What would you think about him landing there in Atlanta? In a division uh, that's winnable. Uh, Russell Wilson would never survive with Belichick. Just won't have he may not have any options. Yeah, he won't survive. He can't handle that. Uh, Belichick's too rough on quarterbacks. Intentionally, he's rough on quarterbacks. Um, he was rough on Tom, and Tom he could was. take him. Yeah, he was. You know, he's he, and and that was part of. I hate the I hate the phrase the Patriot way. Okay, because I think it's kind of bullshit. It is, but but <coughs> it is part of what made the Patriots great is that Tom would submit to the criticism uh, from Belichick which told everybody else, if Belichick's willing to do that to the quarterback, I'm not a sacred, I'm not a sacred cow as, a fellow, as another player. I better be sharp, right? And that was the key. But if you're a quarterback, you, that's hard to take. You know, you're usually, quarterbacks usually get their butts kissed, you know, along the way, and they don't get ripped like that. So you have to have a special kind of guy. Russell Wilson will never survive in that. Um, he just, he just, he just can't. And I don't think he's a good enough player. What I would say is if I'm Belichick, you know, you're saying, okay, Pioli makes sense. He's lived in Atlanta. He's worked in the Falcons organization. He knows his way around the building. Rich McKay. I don't know how Belichick thinks about Rich McKay. Rich is more of a business guy at this point in time. He's not really working on, no. on personnel. He, he, he he's the, the organization ahead right. of the competition he, committee. Right. He parachutes in when he needs to. If you're if you're saying, look, Arthur, you want to keep you want to keep Rich McKay, I'm fine with that. Just you know, he he stays on that side of the building. I'm over, I'm over here, and I'll call him when I need him. You know, if if I need him, that's fine. And I'm sure Rich doesn't care at this point in the time in his life. No, he'll be, well, he's he'll a be good our, friend of mine. Be, right, right, but he'll just you know, I mean, he'll yeah. he'll stay in his lane and make his money. Right. By the way, a good football man too, uh, though he did help build the Bucks. He did. I mean, look, Rich, Rich has a very good. Rich has a very, very good resume. But Belichick is Belichick, and he's not taking it. or he's not taking orders or, you know, from a guy that a he doesn't has never really worked with. B just doesn't really know that well. So, I would fully expect that Pioli would come back um, for that, um, and I would think that he would be wise to go get a Josh McDaniels. And frankly, I would go draft one of the quarterbacks in this draft. I would get a young kid who just tell him, look, kid, this is the way it's going to be. At 71? Yeah, at 71. They have a high enough pick. They, they look, do. What, what, what are you, you going to get? What are you going to go sign Kirk Cousins? Yeah, but I don't need to have anything special in the NFC South to win it. Look at right, Baker right, Mayfield. But, but, but he, right, but – like you still want to win the championship. You're playing I, for title. I, I get it. I do. I, I think I think you I think you have to go get a guy in this draft. And let me just say this. Caleb Williams. Caleb Williams is going to be available. So is Jimmy Garoppolo. I don't care about Jimmy Garoppolo. He's Yeah, but he's, Bill might. No, they they know the injury situation. It's it's he he's a china doll. You just can't you can't play with that guy how about how about kirk cousins <sighs> look at you man you, you, you give me the constipation face i mean what's wrong with cousins nothing's wrong with cousins you're gonna pay 50 million bucks for it though. i'm not paying 50 million dollars for that guy <laughs> well, you're now we're talking be. about something different here right but he's gonna cost close to 50 million Get bucks a year not a way Want to bet? You think that guy's going to make $50 million? Want, yeah, I hear number one, want to bet number two, will you pay? No. Two. <laughs> All right. Hey, I'll, so. I'll bet you, you right. I, I you will bet you right now. No, no. Part? I'm going to bet you right now, right now as we sit here, that 
Kirk Cousins will make a minimum of $45 million a year on a three to four year contract. And virtually every dollar of it will be guaranteed. I wouldn't give, oh, so wait, two years, a hundred million. Easy, easy, easy. Where do you think Vrabel lands? Um, you know, the Chargers are interviewing him today. That makes sense. Um, he could probably politic his way through the Chargers. He's the kind of presence they need. Um, you know, again. If if wants, been... You think Harbaugh wants to coach in the NFL again? I think he wants power wherever it is. Isn't that the, the whole story that came out about his negotiation? Oh, with yeah. Hey, if like, I, because you know what he doesn't want? He doesn't want to be fired with cause. So if he signs that 10-year, $100 million deal, he doesn't want Michigan to go in there and go, well, guess what? Here's your last paycheck. I'll see you later. This guy's putting the parameters on the exit more than the front end of what the conversation is, how much money. To him, it's not about the salary. It's about the way it could end for him right. there. Right. Because so he knows. Like he, this. I'll he take knows. Million. He gets, guess what he's – think about what he's saying. I'll take $11 million, which is $9 million less than I probably could make. In the NFL, I could probably get 20 per, which he could, I think. And not from the not from San, not from the not, no, not, not from, from the, the Spano family. Spanoses are not paying that. I I I, I Arthur no, Blake the, the Spanoses will pay. They'll they'll pay eleven or twelve. They ain't paying twenty. No, they're no. But Arthur Blank may pay twenty. He he will. He definitely will pay. 20. He's going to pay he twenty pay. for Bill. Right. He may pay, may pay more than that. But it sounds like he wants Bill more than he wants Harbaugh. Here, get this. So here here's what he says to Michigan. Hey, I'll tell you what, okay, you can't fire me with cause, and I want that ironclad in the contract, and I'll sign a 10-year, $100 million deal with you, and I stay at Michigan. And I'm thinking to myself, can you imagine that kind of kind of uh, cannolis you have to have to go, hey, if I break any kind of laws or do any kind of bylaws in the NCAA, you can't fire me with cause or any reason whatsoever, and you owe me the $100 million. Hey, I guess that's great. Uh, I have, Victor goes to spoils, right? Carte blanche, baby. I can do anything I want. <laughs> I can run run naked around Ann Arbor all I want, and nobody can say a word. I mean, really, it's not. Man. It's literally not that. I'm not trying. You know, that's not really what it is. It's why well, look you at know, you, having, NCAA you, look at you being Mr. Political. Look at you being Mr. Politically Correct because you have you know there's saps in the world that don't understand. It's a goof. Well, that's why I'm trying. It's it's not being politically correct. It's being don't take this literally what I am saying because you're not intelligent enough to understand. Thank that you joke. very much. I get that. Hey, how about this one? What are you more interested in watching this weekend? C.J. Stroud versus Lamar Jackson or Mahomes Allen? I've seen Mahomes Allen. I haven't seen Jackson Stroud. I want to see Jackson Stroud. I want to know what that's about. And because there are also – Look, there are other issues within that. There's Jackson against himself, right? There's Jackson, like, is he is he the better quarterback? Like, I think Lamar Jackson is a better quarterback today than he was during his MVP season in 2019, right? I, I, I firmly believe that. But you have to prove that in the playoffs, right? So, so show me, Lamar. But – you know, the, the Stroud factor is big in it. The other thing is, if you go over the last three games, Houston's numbers of the last three games are outstanding, you know, in terms of what they've done, in terms of dominating, you know, yards per play differential, moving the ball up and down the field, holding opponents, and, and you know, defensively, you know, Willie Anderson, or Will Anderson, I should say, has been terrific here in the second half of the season, really taken off. Stroud has been, you know, great all year. They're like peaking at exactly the right time. So what what some people might would have would have believed was sort of a rollover game for Baltimore. I think this game's a lot tougher for Baltimore than people think. Um, and you it's think, especially you think a lot Lamar's tougher. the winner. I'd take Lamar. I'd take Lamar. I'd build around Lamar. I, I think, again, he gives you a chance to get to the Super Bowl. He gives you a chance. You're in the playoffs every year. Is he perfect? No. Okay. Has he gotten better as a quarterback in very significant ways? Absolutely. 
100%, he has gotten gotten better. Now, what are we seeing? That, uh, Marlon Humphrey is going to be out? Yeah, Marlon Humphreys is Ooh. out for the divisional matchup mm. versus the Texans. Um, wow. That kid just – that kid, C.J. Stroud. Yeah. I'm telling you, that Nico Collins kid, too, the way that they get guys open, I mean, it is really – Incredible to watch that slow week guy, dude. I'm telling you, man. You talk about yeah, taking 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 uh, taking up after his dad, right, Bobby? You know, old yeah, man Bobby. I mean, really good. that guy is some. They're doing magical things. That I'll tell you this. There's no coincidence. Do you agree, Jason? There's no coincidence that Casario leaving New England and going down to Houston and seeing what those guys have done. Look at look at what they did in the draft, getting Stroud and Will Anderson. Just this last year here, moving up to get all those guys and the positions that they move, hiring of the coordinators. Boy, man, there's no doubt that that had to be a factor in the demise of New England at the end there a little bit too because look at the money and how young that team is and the head coach. They're going to be a force in the next five years, in my opinion, because they're going to continue to get better. I, I'd say I thought before this season, I thought Jacksonville has a chance to really run that division for the next three or four years. And Jacksonville just like threw yeah, it away. Lawrence went the other way. Right. They went the, the other one. Uh, Lawrence went the other way. The whole thing, Stroud, really overtook it. And now I look at Houston and go, these guys could be, these guys could be kings for a while. You know, they they really could. You know, Jacksonville's really got to step it up because Stroud, Stroud's a better player than Lawrence. You know, like it's. In, in year one, he's done. He's done more in one year than Lawrence has done in three years. Really. If you're gonna pick a person right now to start your franchise with, you're picking C.J. Stroud, absolutely. Over Law oh, and, I, and, over and Lawrence, Lawrence, and I'm a fan of Lawrence still. I think he's. Yeah. I, I, like I like Lawrence. I like Lawrence. Stroud. I'll take that. I'll take that Lawrence. I had but... five picks. I mean, in a rookie year, five picks. Peyton Manning at 28. Just yeah. want to put that in proper perspective, okay? I mean. Peyton Manning, it's, twenty-eight it's, picks, his first year in the league. Uh, yeah, it, no, again, it's 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 you know it's a different set of circumstances, all those kinds of things. But it's a staggering difference. It is a staggering difference. I mean, at, at face value, you just go. That kid Stroud knows how to play. He does, and man. He, he he knows how to play at a much higher level. Um, I mean, he's a terrible quote, though. God, you know, just it's like nuclear luge, man. He's a, yeah, I don't even, I'm not talking about the religion stuff. Don't get me on the story on that. I don't care about that. <laughs> but just the, I mean, the, the, the quotes are always so boring. They're just so boring. Like, come on, I man. Have a little design for him. Have like, a little I, flavor. I, I, I know it's I, by design, but have some flavor, man. Have something. Give me, give me a, some cane stuff somewhere, man. <laughs> well, we could always have, you know, Aaron Rodgers talking about vaccinations and such. You want, you want that? You mean that kind of stuff? I mean, that's entertaining. <laughs> yeah. All right. Here's here's entertaining. Jordan, are, who are you more surprised with with this in their play? Jordan Love or Brock Purdy? Well, Brock Purdy's from out of nowhere, right? Like <coughs> we've got. I thought Brock Jordan Purdy. Love sucked. I, I had no I, see. I didn't pass judgment because I just you know it, it was too few games, so I was more patient with that. Um, I would heard people say that they thought he was going to to suck, but I put that down to yeah, most young quarterbacks suck. It's just the way that this this world works, right? He didn't, but like he didn't look like he knew what to do early this year, right? But last year he had a game where he like went, you know where you sat up and you went. Oh, that's that's something, right? That's different. The Eagle game. Yeah, and he was like, he was good, and so it's like, okay, now you're taking over for Rodgers. I, I like to be patient with these guys. I mean, I, that's the one thing we don't do in this league enough of. It's like it takes time to learn this stupid position. I, I say stupid. I mean, it's like it's a freaking hard position, man. Like it's the fantastic. hardest. He's fantastic. Not, right. He's and and the thing about it is when you watch him. The game has slowed down so much for him. Like, defenses don't come out and do things that just make him go, whoa, I don't know what's going on. And, you know, like you still see Tua, his head, Tua's head gets going too fast, and you're like, okay, here comes the interception. Because Tua hasn't, hasn't 
quite gotten there yet. I'm not saying he can't, but he hasn't gotten there quite yet. With Jordan Love, you saw that in the first half of the season. Like he got frazzled the first half. And then all of a sudden he's like slowed, it slowed down, it slowed down, slowed down. And then that Thanksgiving game, like at Detroit, like boom, like here I am, deal with me. Here I am, I'm good. Here I am, watch me throw this pass. Here I am. I watched every tape of Aaron Rodgers. Watch me do the back, the back foot throw, you know, to take a little off the pass. All those little things. He's been he's been awesome. How about this, man? Think, um, Jace, is such a stupid <coughs> game. Think about this, though. You could possibly have, over the next 10 years, three quarterbacks, 42 years of quarterbacks in Green Bay, and there's only three of them. When you're talking about, like, Marino and the whole thing with Tua and all that, finding a quarterback, Green Bay could have three guys over a 42-year span that played in Green Bay, I don't know if, you know, Montana and Young, that was there for a bit. I mean, Danny White kind of in stallback, maybe a little if you want to go something yeah. like that. But, dude, I, I have never seen anything like that in my life where you could almost have 50 years of football with three dudes playing quarterback for you at a championship level. That says a lot about Gutekest and all them guys up in Green Bay and – Going back to Ron Wolf and them guys, I tell you they may not have an owner, but that's some that that's some job at scouting that position. Well, scouting the position and training the position because remember they trained two of those guys, Love and Rogers, right? They you know, looked at didn't... the coaches they had around both of them, all three of them too. I mean, Matt Lafleur's turning out to be a hell of a coach. I I always thought the most important thing is Matt Lafleur needed to get his team back. You know, like the last year, last year when Rogers was ripping them on, you know, and, and criticizing play calls. I'm like, well, Florida needs to get the, the team back, or he's not going to have a very long career. Well, he got the team back. He got he has control of that team. He's the one calling the shots, and that was really critical. Uh, what happened this year? But yes, they train. They're patient. They have patient ownership. You know, I'd say ownership management. They have patient management. You know, they have. Um, Mike, I'm sorry, what's uh, the president of the team? Mike um, uh, McCormick? No, not McCormick. It's, um, is it Murphy? Right. Yes. Yeah. Mike Murphy. Mar yes. Mark Murphy. Mark, Mark Murphy. Murphy. Mark, Mark Murphy. Murphy. Mark Murphy is a former player. Mark right, Murphy. Under, yeah, well, and, but he played for Washington as well. And, you know, like, that's a guy who gets it. Like, they understand the football side of it like this takes time you know be patient sit here and wait for it you know the quarterback takes time sometimes to work with you know a young guy sitting for two or three years is not necessarily a bad thing I work with aaron Rodgers. it's working with jordan love you know we don't have to just draft one at you know the top five and then throw him out there and he's going to be the guy you know even though he's not necessarily ready be patient with the position. React to what does that player, how does he handle learning best? Not just, hey, we took the guy and it's like, you know, Jeff George, you, you're you're the starter, dude. Go for it. Sometimes it works with guys like that. You know, Peyton Manning was starter from day one. He was ready for the job. Jordan Love was not. So let him take a little time. Who have you been more surprised with the reclamation project what baker mayfield has done in tampa or that jared golf who was kind of thought of to be a, a, a bridge quarterback in detroit and all of a sudden now here he is hosting a second playoff game in detroit which is unheard of and baker mayfield knocking the eagles out and here's a guy that's probably going to earn himself a number near three when this coming off season comes on a contract extension who who you been more impressed with, Mayfield or Goff? And Goff is is the better of the two players overall. Um, and well, they both they both went through a lot of damage. Um, Jared Mayfield Goff was probably, be, would you agree, Jason? Jared Goff may be the most underappreciated quarterback. Do you know that this is the fourth time in six years he's thrown for over four grand? 
No, he's a good look. He's a good player. Um, there are still things about his game that I think can be attacked. But, you know, that's nothing. New. Inconsistency. Like, well, it's it's look. If you don't have a great running game where you can keep the pass rush off of him, he he doesn't like bodies around him. Now that doesn't make him unique. There are lot, lots of quarterbacks don't like bodies around them, right? Like that's that's how this game works. Pressure, but he he doesn't like it a lot because he's not a very big dude. Like I know he. Is. I know I, I know he's tall, but <clears throat> the dude is skinny, right? He's he's built a lot like Joe Montana. He looks more like a guy who should be playing basketball than a guy who should be playing football. It's just it's just the way that he's built. Okay, that's that's all right. But you've got to make sure that you give him a little time. The, you know, the other thing with Goff is he's got to get the ball out of his hands. He's got a little, you know, occasionally in critical moments, he's got a little Jim Everett disease where the ball gets held just a little too long. He likes to process it a little longer. He's gotten better at it, but it still gets there once in a while. I mean, look, it cost him that Super Bowl against against New England when he was with the Rams, when he didn't hit the receiver at the front of the end zone and tried to hit, hit him at the back of the end zone, and Jason McCourty flies by and knocks the pass away. That was the most critical play in that game, all right? And that, that switched the momentum completely and eliminated any chance the Rams had of winning that game. But he had a shot at it, right? But you know, he didn't process it fast enough. So I'm really impressed with what he's done. But Baker Mayfield, that's a heck of a year. I still look at Baker and go, I'm not sure I totally believe all this. I, I, I know, man. I'm with you. I go, really? I don't know. I mean. I just, I, I'm like, okay. How about this? Aren't you, aren't you like this? I want to see him do it again. <laughs> right. like, you know, like Jared Goff did it last year. Yeah. Yeah. Went to a Super Bowl before. Yeah. Like, I see Jared Goff, like, I see Jared Goff as a more impressive quarterback overall. But there's, you know, there's something about Baker that makes you keep coming back going, you know, I'm hoping I get a little more. Like, he doesn't, he doesn't turn me off the way that Johnny Manziel turned me off from, like, day one. Like, and he has that chutzpah like Johnny Manziel, but Johnny couldn't play. Baker can play. Yeah, he that's that is so true here. I gotta ask you some Hall <coughs> of Fame things before I get you out of here. Uh -huh. By the way, you know, I know you know Nancy Gay out in the Bay Area. And so uh -huh. I heard a story, man, and you know, I, I was kind of texting back and forth with I don't mean to name drop here with Jerry Rice. And I go, he goes, Did you hear what she did on my Hall of Fame induction? I go, No, I, I was expecting something hard. Would you want to hear what she did? I go, what? She goes, all she did was she stood up and said Jerry Rice and sat back down. I said, that's a compliment, numb nuts. I go, I go, I go, I go when those guys do that, when those guys do that, it's a con. He goes, man, she didn't even say anything I did. I go, because everyone in the room knows what you did. They didn't need Jerry, to be told. We saw told. it. We saw it. <laughs> he was saying, wait, he was so offended. He goes, that's all she said. And I go, I go, Jerry, I go, that's a compliment with these guys. The less they say about you in that meeting, the way I look at it, it's the best thing. When someone has to go three hours on pitching someone, you're not getting in. But if someone goes, Jerry, she goes, all she did was she goes, Jerry Rice, and sat back down. I'm like, that is such a compliment. Yeah, there's, there's nothing else that needs to be said. You're Michael Jordan of football. Right, like, like, I mean, like, did they, they, they? I go, they did that with Seau. Somebody stood up, and I think it was. Um, uh, it wasn't quite Seau. Seau wasn't like that. Favre was like that. Peyton Manning was like that. Um, you know, those guys have been up. Um, sure, Charles, you know, they didn't like even that. do Charles Woodson that way, which, which, Seawood was about as strong a candidate as you can imagine. Um, like but, I think Nick Canapis was the guy that, um, if I'm not mistaken, I think Nick when he when the Chargers were still in San Diego, I think he was the Hall of Fame presenter. I think it was the presenter for a say out. He went on a little bit. It wasn't a very long one. It wasn't a very long discussion. Um, you know, he was in. But the hey. guys who the guys who have been the guys who have been stand up, sit down, are guys like 
Walter Payton. Rice. Rice, Montana, uh, Marino. Yeah. Um, Elway. Elway, you know, like Favre, Manning, like, like Jerry, come on, man. Don't you get how he it works? He was so, he, he I, I, honest to God, he was like, really, he goes, I heard a story. Nancy Gage just stood up and said my name and sat down. I go, I go, no nuts. That's a compliment. <laughs> he, he goes, he, he goes. Did he get it? Did he get I, it I afterwards? That, he didn't say did anything have- about anything I did. And I'm like, because everyone knows what you did. We don't have to be told. And you're sitting in a meeting like that. And someone goes, is Jerry Rice a Hall of Famer? It's a dumb question. That's why she did it that way. <laughs> of course yeah. it is. Hey, so hey, any know. news on the front with the Hall of Fame? Anything coming out of anything? Do you, um, no, surely you guys are getting talk. close to talk. having to make a decision soon. I can't talk about it at this point. Oh! <laughs> what a goat you are. That is so great. I love you, man. Guys, you, you want anything to go out right now? Look at you, man. All smirky shit. That stupid Stanford. I got, I got, I got, I got, look, I'm honoring the pledge I made. Okay. It's pledge okay. Made. When will we know? On the Thursday before the Super Bowl when they have the television show. In Atlanta? Yeah, they they do it every year where the 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 way that they do it, they do that honors show where they announce the MVP and all the other people, all the other awards, and they announce, the, they, they announce the Hall of Fame got sele- selections that day. Now I'm sure that some news will get out here and there that certain <coughs> guys came and stuff like that, but they try. You know, the agreement is they got to keep it secret until the honors show. So, oh yeah, because of the door knocks. <laughs> yeah, well, the door. I mean, that's but that's important to those guys. Like, I think the door knocks are, you know, a pretty pretty awesome thing. Um, I do too. Yeah, I, I, it's that's it's pretty special to see a guy break down in tears after he finds out he's made it. Like, that's Have a, you ever had a guy call you after and what? thank you for? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've had guys thank me. I've, you know, Terrell Davis, who I fought for pretty hard. I saw him that night, you know, after he made it. And, you know, he gave me a hug. And, you know, Zach Thomas called. And, you know, guys have called, you know, thank you. But, you know, and I just, and I look, and I just look and I just say, hey, thanks. It was a privilege to watch you play um, because it was. It's, a, you know, like for me to have watched almost all of, of Zach Thomas's career um, was a privilege as a sports writer, you know, mm-hmm. to watch Dan Marino throw a football was a privilege like that. People don't get, you know, when I get to go watch him practice every day and, and play and, you know, like that's why, that's why you do this job. Like you don't do this job. You don't do this job because you're making a, 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 a shit ton of money. You do this job because you love sports. Let me tell you this. When I, when I, my first game was against Walter Payton. And dude, As I, for I, I, my whole journey was really mm-hmm. weird because I got declared ineligible. I got put in a supplemental draft and I was a cane on Friday and Sunday I played against the Bears. And so I had a college helmet on 48 hours soon, earlier and I had a Buccaneer helmet on. Um, 48 hours later, and I'm looking, and there's, I mean, this was 87, and it was two years removed from that 85 team, so pretty much all the guys are back. And so here comes Walter Payton, and there's McMahon, and there's, like, Tom Thayer and all these guys, and I'm sitting there, Keith Van Horn and shit, and I see, like, Mongo and I and um, Hampton 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 and all them guys. And sure enough, man, here comes Walter Payton. And my first hit, he hits me in the face on a block, on a trap block. And he, all he starts doing is going, he, 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 with that little tiny high pitch laugh. <laughs> I got back up. Irv Randall, John Randall's brother. I'm sitting there and I'm wobbling around. And I go, I just got fucking hit by Walter Payton. This is so great. <laughs> and I go, I got I to gotta walk off the field. And, it, and the guy goes like this. It's second down. I said, I want grapes in my salad. 
And the guy looked over. <laughs> and the guy goes like this. And so and I went, yeah, man, I th- I'll take some grapes in my salad. <laughs> He hit me so hard, man. I almost vomited in my mask. Okay. I'll have grapes in my salad. (laughs) That's like, what is it? Larry Izzo. Larry Izzo told a story about when he went to New England and he played, he's playing against Zach, you know, and the the Dolphins, right? And they're, you know, they're former roommates, right? Like from, from training camp and stuff like that, their rookie year and stuff like that. And here comes Izzo as a special teams guy running down the field and here comes Zach running down the field, you know, on a special teams guy with the dolphins. And he goes, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to go smack this guy. And he goes, Zach hits me so hard (laughs) that I had like this lump on my, on my head and it wouldn't go away for weeks. I went to the doctor eventually and they said, this is the kind of trauma we normally see from car accidents. <laughs> Jason, I got to look at something here. Hang on for a second before I let you go here. I got to look. So I want to show you something here. This is the Bucks versus the Packers. And do you remember we used to have to play a game there at Milwaukee? Um, yeah. We used to have to play a game at County Stadium. Right, yeah. We have to play a game at County Stadium here. I'm going to yeah. look and see if that guy, that guy Murphy, man, because I, I thought he Mark, was. Mark, Mark Murphy? I thought he was a Packer, too. I think he was temp- short term. Oh, here he, he is. Be. Yeah, here he is right here. Look. So I played. Mark Murphy's on here. He's on right. this roster in 87, and I'm on this. Ro- yeah, we're all in here. And. One of the things that I because re- I remember Mark Murphy now playing for the Packers and he played in Washington too. I remember that. Yeah. And one of the really weird things was is that James Lofton standing here. And if you remember anything about the dynamics of playing near a county stadium, can you believe not playing at Lambeau today, not having Packer games at Lambeau was crazy, right? So I remember walking off the field, man, and I'm running off the field. And I slam right in it. James Lofton knocks me on my ass. He goes, rookie, your sideline's over there. Because we're all on the same sideline. I'm going like, what the fuck is going on? You were all on the same sideline because you were playing on a baseball diamond. Right. That all county stadium. Yeah, it was short short on one side. I remember county stadium. Yeah, (laughs) it was short on one side, man. Can you imagine not playing a game? I, like I covered at, a game at, at Lambeau I, Field I covered, today. I covered a county game at County Stadium too. With the Packers, I think Irving Spikes went off for the Dolphins that day. But yeah, I, I remember covering a game at County Stadium in Milwaukee. I kind of liked it because you could fly into Milwaukee instead of having to fly into to Green Bay or Appleton. One of those. Yeah, you have to fly more. into Appleton and take a bus over to Green. Hey, when you go, and I have played at Lambeau, and yeah. so when you have to fly into Appleton, and when you get on the bus. You're driving through these like people's communities and right by their homes, and you're like, "Where's the stadium?" And like the guy go, "You're you're going through all the and like, hey dude, are we gonna eat dinner at somebody's house?" I'm like, "Where are we going?" And all of a sudden, you come over there, the ridge, and there it is. There's Lambo in the middle of nowhere, like yeah. in the middle of a cornfield. Well, it's a middle of a cornfield, and there's like a neighborhood right next to it on one side. Yeah. You know, <laughs> right? It's like, and everybody's like, "Hey, come park here for twenty bucks and stuff like that." No, it's I look, Lambo's awesome. That that whole atmosphere is awesome. But it was weird. It was weird covering the game in Milwaukee, but I did prefer it. Um, but look, to get back to the original point, like the Hall of Fame thing is so great. The 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 guys have thanked me for what I did. And I'm like, look, I, you, you're the one who played and all that kind of stuff, which is true. Like, I'm just, I'm just one of the guys voting, but it's a privilege and it's an honor to be part of that process. Um, I think I, it's, I, I, it's a, it's a, it's, it's really, it's, um, it's one of the things I hold dearest as a sports writer. Um, not don't because take of, this, don't take this offensive, but I, I don't respect the baseball writers because they make, the vote more about them. You guys that do the football hall of fame, you make it more about the players and you care about it. And especially you, Jace, all the years I've known you, I mean, you know, I, I, I don't like people using their vote to accentuate their position in sports and make you relevant. 
and you tried to not to do that, but you are part of the process. And I think it's fabulous that you're part well, of the I, process. I, and I, I think and you're I needed. I, like, I appreciate all that. I think everybody tries as hard as they can to do it right. And, you know, as long as we do that, we're, we're going to be okay. But it's it's a hard thing. I like. I always tell people, they, they say to me, oh, the football process is terrible, this and that. And I'm like, okay, what's your idea? And every time <laughs> they bring up their idea, like I go, well, did you think about this, this, and this? Like my favorite one is, oh, only most people who are in the Hall of Fame should vote. No way. Like, There'd be two guys in the Hall of Fame. Like everybody's every buddy thing. being. Everybody's, <laughs> well, number one, everybody's buddy. But but the other thing about it is they put in no one. They 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 think once you get in the Hall of Fame, you think you're so much better than everybody else. And not everybody, but a lot of guys. Like, oh, that guy doesn't belong. And that guy, like Dion's thing. Oh, put less guys in. Hey, sorry, Dion, not everybody's you. Okay. And, you know, other guys have great careers without like being like you. And that's where I disagree a little bit with Dion. I do believe that I worry about us putting too many guys in. I respect that opinion. But, but, you know, not everybody plays to that kind of standard, and, but they still deserve to be in the Hall of Fame. Um, it's, there's no perfect process for voting for Hall of Fame. The baseball writers won. I don't like that one. There's no discussion that goes with it. There's no, you know, banter back and forth among people in a real way. Um, there are faults with our system as well. Um, the bas the basketball Hall of Fame. I don't even know what the system is, but I I, I joke all the time. As much as I love basketball, I don't yeah. know what the metric is. I don't know what the metric is, other than if you can dribble with your off hand and make an <laughs> offhand layup, you get in. Like that, that's how simple it is for the Basketball Hall of Fame. They put so many people in the Basketball Hall of Fame. And partly because it, it comprises all of basketball. Yao Ming. Not, right. Like, I just, really? I, I don't even Yao know. Yao Ming over lot. Chris Weber? Really? I don't know. You know, look, I don't like, know all the names that are in the Basketball Hall of Fame. I just, when I look at it and, I, and I've, oh, and I'm going to the <clears> Basketball <throat> Hall of Fame, I'm like, like this, there should be an NBA Hall of Fame. It should be strict. A college basketball Hall of Fame, it should be strict. A women's basketball, you can make that part of it. But they throw everybody together, and then they put, like, 20 people a year in. And I'm like, like that's that seems too easy to get in. And so you don't want it to be too easy. You don't want it to be too exclusive. Try and find the right balance. I'm going to ask you one last question on this. <clears throat> you think they'll hold like they do with Kurt Schilling? Aaron Rodgers' politics against him when he's considered for the Hall of Fame? I mean, Jace, you may not, but I'm talking about the group. Do you think someone no, in the group? No, we don't care. I mean, The guy in one, Chicago wouldn't vote him MVP because of his stance against well, he's, yeah, but he's not a Yeah, but he's not a voter for the Hall of oh, Fame. Okay. Okay, that guy doesn't vote for the Hall of Fame. So, Arch Ar Ar doesn't Ar call. Okay, okay. Uh, no, he does not. And so... And that was a lame point anyways, right? Like, it was just, like, Aaron's done some things that, that annoy the hell out of me. Um, he does. But, which is, but, you know, okay, you just, you're doing stuff, you say some stuff that annoys the hell out of me, but whatever. I'm, I'm still buying a ticket. <laughs> if you're playing, if you're playing on Sunday, I'm still watching, Right. You know, it's it. I you know I liken that to you know people got pissed off at Ali when he took a stand on politics, right? In the back in the sixties, he wouldn't go into the draft and all that. I said, yeah, you, yeah. But when he decided to box, you said, how much do I have to pay for the ticket? I'll never watch that guy. I'll never this. And then was like, oh, he's boxing again. What do I? Where do I sign up? Right? Like, and that, and that, that's how it is. As a football player, <coughs> excuse me. You know, Aaron Rodgers all day, every day, and. You know, I'll deal with the other stuff another time. I don't care. I, I and I and I think that most people won't care. I got asked that about you know Brady and Belichick. You know, particularly Brady when Deflate made, when Deflate no Deflate Gate. Oh, okay, Deflate Gate. Uh, would, <coughs> would I hold Deflate Gate against Brady? And I said um, it'll take me about less than a second to to vote for Tom Brady. <laughs> Okay, when his name is up there and I have to hit, go on my computer and, and press the button, you know, like 
time me, it'll take less than a second. Like I'm putting Tom Brady in the Hall of Fame. Don't talk to me about Deflate Gate. I don't care about it. To, not to that extent. No, we're not. I learned more about doing. pressure on my balls or balls uh, for five years than I did in the entire time that I ever. I lost five years of my life talking about <coughs> more so than anything in my life because they went on to win three Super Bowls after that. And I'm like, people, you've got to be kidding me. Okay. It's a nothing burger. Jason, I love you. Thank you so much, man, for being part of that great process, spending time with us as you always do. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate it. Anytime, dude. Be good. You got it. Great, Jason Cole. Our insider when it comes to the National Football League, we really appreciate it. By the way, he sent me a text message. I cannot tell you if he voted for Eric Allen or not. Remember, he's one of 50 votes. Here, see if you can read. See if you can read Big Sills. Did Jason Cole vote for Eric Allen? <laughs> Tone's like, Sills, are you having a stroke or is that like your epileptic, your, your epilepsy coming back? I, I'm going to do it one last time before I take a time out here. Hang on here now. Ready? Sills, did Jason Cole, did did he vote for Eric Allen? Um, I, <laughs> hey, I think I better take a break right now because <laughs> get, don't get me out of here. Hit the like button. Take a break. Keep it here National Football Show. and Hooters, the perfect pair. Any professional sports coach will tell you there's no substitution for preparation. At Malamut & Associates, that is a tenet by which we live. We prepare from day one for victory. Anything less is not acceptable. Underdog Fantasy has a way for you to play alongside your favorite football team all season long with their Fantasy Pick'em game. You pick between two to five players, select whether they'll go higher or lower on one of their stats, then do what you usually do on a Sunday, watch the games. You can win up to 20 times your money in a single game by going five for five. It's a fantasy game, and the sports betting show wants you to get involved. Go to underdogfantasy.com. When you sign up, use the promo code WIN, and Underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN.
that. Mark Murphy was a former player. Okay, this is an old program from back in the day. And, and here's the old dimensions that we used to have to play a football game in at, at County Stadium. That's where Henry Aaron hit his first home run. I think my aunt went to that game, if I'm not mistaken. The, the, Mike Shula. Mike Shula was on this team with Big Sills. Hold on here. Is Big Sills done there? Dan Silio, 6'2", 282. Played for Ray. And Mark Murphy was on that. I played with Steve DeBerg. Let's see here. Steve DeBerg. I played with Winston. There's Vinny Testaverde. He and I were rookies. Who was on that Green Bay team? Here was on the Packer team. Tom Mikowski was the quarterback. Brent Fullwood was a running back. He played at Auburn. He was a good player. I think he played with Bo. Yep, Mark Murphy, number 37, strong safety. He's now the general manager or the president of the Packers, I believe. Yep. Ross Browner, former Notre Dame guy. John Dorsey, linebacker. You know who John Dorsey is, right? John Dorsey is a former general manager in the NFL. I did not realize that either. Holy cow. Am I old? <laughs> Am I old? Sills, would you do a bag of money up front for Burns or Jones like Jalen to make it cap friendly? You're talking Brian, Brian Burns, right, down in Carolina? Carolina wants to move him. I know they do. Um, how much you talking here? Okay. How much we talking here? You think the Eagles are going to pay $20 million for a defensive end like Burns? Cause he's going to get 20 million. And what are you going to give up for him? You got to give up a first round draft choice for him. And you're talking probably around the 19th pick for him. People kill me. It's not a one-size-fits-all league just because a guy falls at one point doesn't guarantee fit. Absolutely correct. Dan Marino fell the number – AJ, Dan Marino fell the number 28 and had a Hall of Fame career. Um, by the way, that's a good point. That's a great point. I wrote these guys' names down, and – what a, a tone, where are they right now when it comes to projections on the draft? Are they looking at like the 19th pick or 21? Is it between nine? Is it like 19 or 20 that they would have the first pick in the first round? I think it's around 21, 19, 20, 21, somewhere in there. Is it 22? Okay. So it'd be the 22nd pick right now. Is that correct? Okay, 22 overall. I wrote these guys' names down <clears throat> as potential players that you could look at for the upcoming NFL draft. And I, I, I just did first round here, okay? 22, 50, and 53. That's really good. Those are really good picks. Those right there, I mean, right there, that's one and two twos. That's pretty good. That's some quality, man. You're going to get some good football players there at 22, 50, and 53. Now, let me ask you this. You feel comfortable with how we making those picks? How many people feel comfortable with how we making those picks at 22, 50, and 53? Are you, are you good with how we making those moves? <laughs> Uh, not a very political answer here by tone, but uh, it, how about this? It's quotation marks. Let me see here. Let me double. Not me. Let me just say this. 
There's something that rhymes with duck and not me. <laughs> okay? Here's the guys, and I'm with you, but here's who I would take a look at. Now, personally, these are going to be the name. You know what? i got to rephrase that. These are names that are going to be around that that number, number 22. And this is where I think they could go here with this. And I'll tell you my whether I like them or I don't like them. Okay, so the first guy up for those guys to have – now, I think it's corner. I think you've got to get off those corners, and you've got to bring some youth to the cornerback position. Now, he's terrible at it. He, he's terrible at the cornerback position. So it kind of worries me. Do I trust him? Here's some of the names that are going to be around that 22 mark. You trade up, trade down a little bit, depending on who falls or who rises. Do you want a guy bad enough? I think it's corner. They've got to land on a corner. It's a premium position. And what, what am I telling you? You've got to get cheaper financially there. Remember, follow the money. You have such money tied up in those positions with no production. Look at the cornerback positions in Kansas City. It's a great example of showing you how you restructure your entire defense financially. This Cooper Dijon guy from Iowa, man, an Iowa corner. Name me a corner out of the Big Ten that's been a superstar corner and is a superstar corner right now. Not history, I don't care. Right now, the lockdown corners, are they from the Big Ten? Iowa? Who's he guarding? You can't stop the Ohio State wideouts. I mean, who's he playing against? You can't tell me that guy stops Marvin Harrison Jr. or any of those other Ohio State wideouts. Marcus Lattimore is a Big Ten guy? Is he? I, I, I didn't know that. It's, 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 he's been in the league a bit, though, too. Riley Moss? This kid, they say he's a really great-looking talent. I really interview him a lot. Joey Porter Jr. came on really well, didn't he? Played at Penn State. I thought he was a little bit more of a of a safety guy. Um, he's he's he had a really good year. He did. It did it it, it, it did surprise me a little bit. It did surprise me. Marcus Lattimore, Ohio State guy. Yep. Malcolm Jenkins, those are going back 15 years, 10 years a little bit, though. But, okay, that's cool. That's cool. I, 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 I Again, I, I'm with you. This kid from Iowa can move. I've watched him move. He's good, and there's a lot to like about him. Okay? Here's the other corner. Kool-Aid McKinstry. McKinsley from Bama. Man. Those guys play against the best wide receivers in the in, in college football. I love any corner from the SEC. Teron Arnold from Bama as well. That kid, Nate Wiggins from Clemson, is another guy that could be around there too. Kool-Aid can play, dude. He's a good football player. I thought they shut down Georgia in that SEC title game. He can play. The kid from Clemson, Nate Wiggins, I got great respect for him. So to me, the top corners that are going to be in this draft and in the conversation here would be the kid from Iowa, Cooper DeJean, um, Kool-Aid McKinsley, the Teron Arnold from Bama, and Nate Wiggins. Those would be the three guys. Is it three? One, two, three. It's four guys. That to me, I would look at if I'm Howie and corner's got to be a priority here. That kid Wiggins is a baller. He's had a really great career. I thought that Clemson didn't play all that hot last year, but I thought they came on, especially in the back end of that schedule this year 
and they ended up with 10 wins, and I thought they really played pretty well. Okay? They did. They had a disastrous first half. But they came on, and he was part of the turnaround there. Now, I put – I put, would it shock you if the Eagles drafted an O-lineman at 22? Would it shock you if they took a lineman at 22, O-lineman, at 22? Why do I say O-lineman? Well, because they're really gifted at picking O-lineman. And they got the best old line coach in the business, and they're getting help from Kelsey. And you got a bunch of guys in the building that you're going to be able to give input and go to. If I was Howie and I had Jason Kelsey, Lane Johnson, and Jordan Mulata, and um, Landon Dickerson as my go to guys and asking what makes, take a look at this guy if you could for a couple minutes here. I want, to, I want you to take a look at him on film. Tell me what you think. I would ask those guys, what do you think of these guys? More so than a guy who is scouting. Then I would send my scouts and talk to the guys. And to me, an offensive line, why is that important? Well, once again, right, Tone? You got a $50 million investment. I got a $50 million investment that I've got to take care of constantly. Wide receivers and o linemen. If I want Jalen Hurts to be a star player, I've got to constantly have a conveyor belt of O-linemen and wideouts for that guy to continue to get better. It's not just about coordinators. It's also about staying young, staying fresh, never getting behind the eight ball when it comes to guys, you're holding on to guys too long, and you're looking at an heir apparent for Jason Kelsey and maybe the right guard position. Because, listen, Jurgens may have to step into that center role and you got a glaring hole at right guard. Is the kid Sting going to be the guy? I don't know. Well, let's bring another guy in. Like this kid Mims from Georgia. And again, I know some of you are going to go, Georgia? Hey, man, I'm not going to be shy on Georgia, guys. That's a mistake you'll make. They're not, not winning games because they got sorry-ass players on that roster. There's a reason that they have the best recruiting classes by 24-7 and by rivals every year, and everyone looks at them, that's right, the kid Mims, very good, Dirty. That's correct. Don't be shy just because he's at Georgia, and you go, well, look at the Georgia guys. We hey, I don't give a shit about that. I'm looking at the best player available here. I'm looking at the best players. And if he happens to be at Georgia, which is not uncommon and shock, that's not a shocker. I'm going to take him. You can't be afraid to consistently go back to a school unless it's a place like North Dakota State. Nobody is going to draft a quarterback ever again from North Dakota State. Why? They don't play anybody. They have no competition. There's no litmus of success. Wentz had success, but it was limited because he was limited in growing. He did not get this. Carson Wentz, was already who he was when he came out of North Dakota State, and he never grew. He never developed. Now, is, is that an ego problem? You know, I never thought about that, for instance. Think about what I just said. I wonder how much of the problem Carson Wentz had at the end was an ego problem in developing him. Because would we not agree? The ego stunted the growth of Jalen Hurts this year. Why wouldn't they have stunted the growth of Carson Wentz? You can't just pass that off and think that they didn't hurt him also. You know, it's easy to blame Wentz. That's what the organization and how he does. They like to pass it off on someone else. But you can't tell me. Get this. As much as he grew last year, as much as he was stagnant this year, is that on is that on Jalen? Yeah, is that on the organization completely too? You put a limited offensive coordinator around him. How much were you really helping Wentz? Your fair minded Quince, uh, Wentz quit. I'll tell you what, Jalen Hurts had no development this year. 
He did not advance his game in any way whatsoever. And anyone who says that is fooling themselves. Jalen Hurts did not. 2023 was a step back, not a step forward. He regressed. And is that him? Yes. Is that the organization? Yes. Yes. Okay. I also got this kid here too, J.C. Latham from Bama. It's funny, man. All the top guys are around that era, area where they're going to pick a 22. Latham and Mims, Georgia and Alabama. There's no coincidence. I'm going to hang in the SEC. That's what it is. I'm going to go there. Um, I got edge rusher. That Jared Verse. You know, Jared Verse is an interesting. And also, too, Dallas Turner. I'll talk about Dallas Turner in a minute from Bama. He's an edge rusher, too. Um, this kid, Verse, was recruited heavily by the University of Miami. And Jason Taylor said this about him. It reminds you of DeMarcus Ware a little. Big hands, really a great reach. He's got long, he's got a long length when it comes to his arms. His reach is incredible. You want that in an edge rusher. Um, he's got a low, lower body, so it's hard to knock him off the ball. He says he's an exceptional pass rusher. He's got great technique. He really works the angles well. And what I mean by working the angles. You never want to run into an offensive lineman head up. Anytime you do that, you're blocked. It's, you want to you want to work the angles. Got great feet. He knows how to get around the hula hoop. He has an inside move that's great, and you can move him around on your defensive line. You could put him in a 34-43. You can also um, do some things with him on moving him up and down the line of scrimmage. Dan, were you in any given Sunday? Yes. I was an extra in any given Sunday. It was filmed at the Orange Bowl. Yes, it was an extra. We got 50 bucks for it. I don't, hey, it's not a big deal, man. They had a bunch of us standing in the rain. It was, I think we were in the rain scene or something like that. Yeah. Hey, yeah, no. I've, I've been in a few of them things. I was in, I was in a, um, I was in a what 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 was that series back Miami Vice, the one with uh, not Peter Gabriel but with with Phil Collins, he was in it and we, we were like doormen, and we got paid some money to do that. I think we got five hundred bucks for that, believe it or not, and we worked three days down in Coconut Grove for that. <laughs> yeah, right. No, hey man, it wasn't a big deal, but I just know it rained on us, and it was awful. Yeah, and you know who you know who got me in that movie? Hey, 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 Yale, who's the tight end? God, man, he's a friend of mine, and I forgot his name. He played tight end. Jamie Williams. He was a tight end for the 49ers. You guys are going to love this. Jamie came up with the script or the screenplay or something like that. And he gave it to a friend who gave it to Oliver Stone. I met Oliver Stone. And Oliver Stone took it and they made the movie out of it. And I think Jamie Williams, I think the only thing they gave him credit for was they gave him like um, an advisor. I think he was in the movie, but they gave him, they gave him a credit role actually. And they gave him credit for being an advisor to the script if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. My wife was, or she's my girlfriend then, but my wife was with me when we filmed that down at the Orange Bowl. Yeah, they filmed any given Sunday at the OB. Crazy. Yeah. My, my hey, my, I was a, yeah, I was a doorman. Hey, Yale, Oliver Stone was more like, He was like a poet from Hate Ashbury. He was kind of like one of them guys. <laughs> That's Oliver Stone. <laughs> yeah. I don't think he had done JFK yet. I think JFK was done after. Um, 
I think that was done after any given song. Or maybe, I don't know, maybe it was done before it. But, um, yeah, no. Hey, he was he was a wild cat, though, man. Lawrence Taylor was there. We got a chance to talk and hang out with LT. LT bought everyone beers. It was really great. It was a whole bunch of Miami Hurricane guys and some Florida State dudes. And they got a whole bunch of us together, and we were all extras. They had a whole bunch of us. He did Platoon, that's right. He did Platoon with Charlie Sheen. Oh, hey, what's his name? Jamie Foxx? Dude, that guy's this big. He's a little guy. He, he's a little tiny guy. I was shy. I go, that's Jamie Foxx. Oh, shit. This guy's this guy's smaller than uh, your kicker. What's your kicker's name? Oh, by the way, let me throw this at you. Who's the MVP of the Eagles this year? Who's your MVP of, the, of your – is it Jake Elliott? Is that your kicker's name? LL Cool J was there. Yes, sir. It's wait a minute. Hey, hey, Tone, you want to know how bad the Eagles season was? All right. So you're telling me that the MVP of the Eagles is Jake Elliott. A kicker. Is Jake Elliott the MVP of the Eagles? Jake Elliott. <laughs> oh, my God. Wait, I, I'm going to tweet that out. Jake Elliott is the Eagle MVP. It's just all you need to know about the Eagle season. The MVP is Devontae Smith. All hell, Slim Reaper. I don't know, man. Who won you more games? Smith or Jake Elliott? Man, I know he won that. I know he won that Commander's game. I know he won that Bills game. Hey, look at me, man. I'm fighting for a kicker. <laughs> Holy cow. I'm fighting for a kicker. Okay, Eagle guys, who would you vote for MVP, Jake Elliott or Devontae Smith as the Eagle MVP? Our kickers foot. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> yeah. no, foot, you know, kickers aren't football players. I asked you who the MVP of your, your shitty season was. Oh, I mean, of your team. I'm sorry. Uh, A.J. Brown? Yeah, yeah, you know, he, A.J. had better numbers than Devontae. Had better numbers. How could you name Devontae Smith your MVP when the other guy had better numbers? Most valuable per... Oh! Look at my boy changing the metrics and moving the yardsticks on big sales. Oh, yes, Grasshopper, you're learning very well. Yes, Grasshopper, you are learning very well on how you move the sticks. Way to go, man. Not most valuable player, right? Look at that kid, man. Holy cow, no wonder he's running circles around everybody. He knows how to move the sticks. Your Honor, he's getting it. <laughs> yes, he is. AJ quit? Nah, I don't know about AJ quitting. AJ got banged up, man. AJ got banged up. If Jake Elliott is your MVP, that's how we grade it. You can't give a kick or anything like that. What are you, crazy? The only thing Jake Elliott's MVP of is drinking cocktails. That's it. Got to pick a football player. Shit, I'd pick Big Dom before I pick... Um, Jake Elliott. If I had to pick an MVP, I'd pick Devontae too. I would. I'd pick Devontae. All right, let me take a time out. Hit the like button. Keep it here, National Football Show. Hooters, the perfect pair.
Any professional sports coach will tell you there's no substitution for preparation. At Malamut & Associates, that is a tenet by which we live. We prepare from day one for victory. Anything less is not acceptable. Underdog Fantasy has a way for you to play alongside your favorite football team all season long with their Fantasy Pick'em game. You pick between two to five players, select whether they'll go higher or lower on one of their stats, then do what you usually do on a Sunday, watch the games. You can win up to 20 times your money in a single game by going five for five. It's a fantasy game. And the sports betting show wants you to get involved. Go to underdogfantasy.com. When you sign up, use the promo code WIN, and Underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. I ranked the final eight teams going into the divisional round this weekend on Saturday and Sunday. I got Houston eight. Is that too low? God, they're good. <laughs> they're good. They're, but I don't know if they know how good they are. And they're young. The coach is young. The quarterback's young. You know, get this. I thought the Houston Texans were going to win four games this year. I thought they'd win four games. Like, I thought they were going to be one of the worst rosters on the planet. Like, I thought they were going to be in, like, in the Cardinals room. Like, they were going to win four games. They're good, man. I don't know. That might be too low. Like, I got the Bucks ahead of them only because of the defense and because of Todd Bowles, I guess. But is are the Bucks better than the Texans? I think. Tampa Bay's got a good defense. I told you, didn't I tell you that? Remember what I told you guys? Don't go to sleep on Tampa's defense, even with the numbers, because you know why? They're healthier now than they've ever been. And there's still a lot of guys on that team that won a Super Bowl. There's still a ton of dudes that won a Super Bowl on that Bucks team. Now, here's a crazy one. I got Green Bay 6. I think everyone's looking at what they did to Dallas. I don't think they're going to go and beat the 49ers. I, I, I do not think that's happening. I think Green Bay's a good football team. I think there'll be a good football team in two years. San Francisco's a little different. I think Green Bay's good, but I don't think they're good enough. I got Detroit five. Detroit's been weird to me this year. You know, they look good. They don't look good. They look good. They don't look good. You know what I mean? There's something about, though, the way they run the ball. And Aiden Hutchinson, hey, here, hey, watch this. Hey, I'm wrong on Aiden Hutchinson. He's a really good-looking pro. As a matter of fact, he's got a lot of Howie long uh, tendencies about his game. He's got a high motor. He's a big motor guy. He's a good-looking football player. I got Kansas City four, Mahomes. Jesus, Grimey, Mahomes, Andy Reid. I mean, you know. Now they got to go on the road and play Buffalo, though. Interesting. I got the Bills three. Dude, that guy, Josh Allen, is playing like a cyborg. He, he's a cyborg. He don't turn the ball over. He's a frightening dude to, to defend. I got San Francisco, too. A lot of pressure on the Niners now. 
Now that the Cowboys and the Eagles are out, you got to win this thing here, kid. Hey, Brock, ain't no Cowboys and no Eagles. You got to go do this. A lot of pressure on the Niners. I got Baltimore number one. It's going to be quite a playoff weekend, man. There's some really great matchups at the quarterback position, too. And I can't wait to see it. So we really appreciate everybody coming aboard. You guys were absolutely spectacular. Fastest four hours in TV, is it not? We appreciate you guys. Xander, Big Joe, we thank you. Tony, you keep kicking ass, man. We totally love you, man. Appreciate it. We thank you. Absolutely killing it. Two to six tomorrow. We'll see you on the flip side. Hooters, the perfect pair.